everyone, and welcome to day four of the Anger Games. We're here on the second day of the second weekend. Uh, with you this evening, I will be joined, uh, I'm Zurich, by the way, and I'll be joined by Wingnut and Jintan here on the cameras. And we also have uh, two guests with us, Howling from the Weekend Warriors, who unfortunately got eliminated, and as well as the brave team captain of Hangry Nubs, Jujak. So welcome, Howling and Jujak. Hope you guys are doing well this evening. Um, so, just to start us off here, Jintan, I'm not too sure if you got a look at the final game yesterday of Templus versus Sudden Vidra. Uh, yeah, I did. I did. It was a really interesting game to watch and kind of an upset, although, you know, Templus do seem to be the masters of the upset. They're such a dangerous team, you know, they've worked together so long. They seem to be in every single tournament, no matter which one it is. And they always seem to, you know, surprise people with how well they do. And this time was no different. I, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do going forwards. Yeah, I think um, going with the Widows, it was a bit unexpected. I, I think um, generally when the Black Ops are priced that cheap, the everyone thinks about a widow in their head and then they play around and they never really commit to it. But Templar's definitely putting that thing to good use. Um, Wingnut, I'm not sure if you have any comments on that game as well. Uh, was that the one that had Zarmads in it? I think it had Zarmads, didn't it? Yes, it was, there were two Zarms and, and the widow three, double widow. Yeah. I, I remember that match. It was actually pretty good to be honest, but the Zarmads didn't really matter. So I, I think you, them, you did mention it before. It's like it, it was a good showcase of what his arm is good for and what his arm is not good for. You know, on either yeah. depends which side of the receiving end you were for that match. Um, but for this evening, we have lined up. The first match is going to be Forklift Certified Goths versus Waffles. Um, then later we'll also be seeing Wolves Among Us versus Odin's voicemail. And then we'll be having AP Stall My Fit for Suspector Fleet. And then uh, Faming Dragons versus Ramrod Shenanigans. After that, uh, we'll basically just be having, um, you know, the winners of those match versus a couple of others. We'll try and keep us formed as things will be happening throughout this evening. I would just also like to mention um, that we do have a special uh, guest appearance here by CCP Chair as well. Uh, she'll be with us here throughout the evening, uh, luckily. Uh, while well, she's also Real running things in the, the background show. for us. <laughs> That's true. Um, Jintan, I'm, if you've been following tournaments, do, do you have any um, highlights you, you like that you've seen so far? Things people have been doing well, doing bad? Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, I've seen a lot of matches. I've kind of just been watching stuff muted whilst I've been working, if I'm going to be perfectly honest. I've watched back as much as I could to prepare for the commentary. But I'm going to be honest, I'm not here for the analysis. I'm not as uh, tuned in as maybe I once was in terms of that side of things. I'm just here to get hyped about watching some spaceships ram into each other, to be perfectly honest with you. Oh, that's fair. I know a, a comment that generally happens, especially from the teams that participate, is, um, oh my goodness, these commentators are getting everything wrong. I, I know personally from being a captain myself, it's uh, I, I would normally mute the stream as well uh, because commentators just get everything wrong. Um, but the reality is, uh, you know, we're not involved as, as these teams are and not as clued up. Um, we try and uh, see what they're doing, but please forgive us if we do get uh, make some really bad calls sometimes. Um, Wingna, do you have any comments of what we've seen thus far? I mean, uh, the presence of the Atonas coming back in, um, people making some Zarm choices on the Logi. I think the Logi has been interesting, but what do you find interesting? Seeing the DPS comps that have kind of evolved ever since the start. I mean, we saw in the Open the Dominic's Nag, and then we're seeing similar things. Like, we saw the APOC Oracle comp, which is, like, entirely out of left field with APOC warped to zero. I'm loving seeing these, like, DPS comps just... I mean, it's DPS. I mean, there's not much to it, right? But so many different ways people have pulled it off. It's just like, okay, what's next? Are we going to see, like, polarized, like... Uh, polarized galente rush now just because why not oh, i love I seeing this like crazy stuff while while we're talking about uh, that, that match we do actually have uh jujack with us here jujack i'm not sure if you have any comments of the um hyperion evaporating in 23 seconds well actually we were at originally quite happy seeing a lot of lasers given that we'd up neutered our comps so heavily one of the reasons why we had the dominics in the first place and then I died in 23 seconds. So we didn't have time to enact anything. Uh, so it was just like a real shock factor for you guys as well, just seeing that happen? Yeah, we were not really expecting a lot of logiless comps. We'd practiced a lot against logiless comps and not loved them. 
at the time. Mm, yeah, I think they have been taking surprise. Um, I, I think in the first weekend, we saw some of the more unrefined no logic comps um, not doing that well, but uh, these attack battle cruisers have been making quite a stir now, I think. Um, so, Haldine, have there been any highlights for you on these comps that the teams have been bringing? Uh, actually, um, yeah, going back to the Zarm, I, I think that, that that's a really strong, like, it, the comps with the include the Zarm, I think, are really strong we we as a team kind of decided that it wasn't that we always went with like the tech two logic as the heart of the comp but i think the the amount of reps that you get out of uh out of the spooled up reps of the zam is just um it's, it's super strong it's, it's hard to crack through like high dps stuff so if you can get it in there with, with a good high dps comp i think they're they're uh they're winners in in my eyes mm, for sure like you know people normally just go like hey you know what's why would you want to have his arm if you just counter it by switching targets? But it doesn't have that bad an initial um, rep um, as much. I think it's, I can't, forgive me with the numbers, I'm going to say like half a Guardian, but it does get up to a Guardian's level quick enough. Uh, we do have the teams moving into the tournament system. We'll, we'll switch over when they start arriving on crit. But um, Jintan and Wingnut, well, actually Wingnut, if, can you go over the bands that the teams have chosen for this round? Sorry, so Forklift Certified Ghost has banned out Rattlesnake, Geddon, Damnation, and Slepnir. The one we won there is the Damnation, that's okay. And then Waffles banning out the Rattlesnake as well, so that's why the Slepnir was an extra ban. And then Naga, Blackbird, Curse. So that's interesting. So you can see that Waffles there are going to try and peel that, you know, critical mass, basically, of ECM that you need to have to have a successful ECM setup. They saw what Templars did to Vydra, and they don't want to get upset, upset here by Forklift. So they're wisely taking those kind of really disruptive ships of the Blackbird and the Curse off the table. Interesting thing, though, is that that happened in that last match. The Blackbird was banned, and they got they brought in the Widow comp instead with the ECM. So that ban might not do what you think there. I feel like they might they could still bring the Double Widow. And just ruin yeah, it. we'll have to see. We'll have to see. We can't comment on what the team support to the field until they land on it for obvious reasons. Uh, the other thing there is that Armageddon ban. What do you think about that? Uh, how how critical has that been lately to these kind of drone setups, and and what makes it so crucial? I mean, I well, like that compared to like banning a Balgorn. Banning a ba Balgorns are so expensive for what they do. Again, can do ninety percent of the job at like way cheaper. It gets long nukes, and you get a drone bait, actually brings some DPS. Yeah, honestly, I, I prefer Geddon's to Balgorns. So I like the ban more. Hmm. So, so the Dominics um, can still actually fill the slot. Like, you would almost think, you know, the Giddin and the Domi have a, um, so say, a one-for-one one maybe comparison that slot, you know, interchangeable. So I, I think it's a more accurate word. Uh, obviously, the Giddin's been better on the Newts, but uh, while the Domi has been more of a threat, as I believe the Domi actually has the tracking bonus for the drones, which makes it a lot more of a scarier threat. Uh, we do have the teams arriving on grid now, though. Um, so if not sure if we have our arena camera ready yet, then we'll be switching over soon. And with that, we'll be handing it over to Jintan and Wingnut to commentate for this first game of Forklift Certified Goth versus Waffles. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Anger Games Arena. As you just heard, I'm here with Wingnut, and we are getting ready to watch Forklift match up against Waffles. And we have some interesting sort of mirror matchups coming up here. Can you introduce the Waffles team for me, please, Wingnut? Yeah, no worries. Waffles bringing in Absolution Hyperion, Zarmad, Double Navy Org, Vengeance, and then a Claw for, you know, Elite Tackle. Meanwhile, here the fork, the forklift team have brought a double apocalypse setup with an oracle and a celestis kind of as their more squishy support, and a vengeance there and the authorist to hopefully clear up the tackle game. We're ten seconds here from the start. What are your predictions? Who's going to get attacked first here, Wingnut? Hyperion for sure, and uh, at least in the Hyperion, or maybe the Zarmad perhaps if they can get some shots off. But we've seen that it's double Oracle, double Apoc, and just obliterate a Hyperion in legit less than thirty seconds. So, yeah, and there you go, they're going straight for it. 
Yeah, there we go. And this is obviously a Logula setup by the looks of things. There's going to be a few rep drones maybe, but nothing else really in terms of sustain here for the red team. So they're going to need to make this kill count. They're going to need to put DPS down range. And e equally, Waffles are going to need to take something off the field from their opponents here. That claw is also hype... taking a ton of damage too. That hype's going to live, I think. Like it's, he's survived long enough. I'm pretty sure he pre-pulsed his reps the moment he saw damage going on him. And that Zarmad's going to start building up and building up and building up the rep. So Claws I suspect that pipe's going to survive. Yeah, you can see that Wally Marts in the Oracle. He's going to be the squishiest team, the team leader probably as well. So and no don't feet picks for him. Kill for them. No feet picks for Wally today. He's going into Hull. He's going to get deleted. Yeah, look at that pop gone. And that hype's still alive. Yeah, it looks like Hey Kaku in the uh, in the Vengeance is also taking a ton of damage. Might even go down, but you know, that Zarmaz is going to have a difficult time splitting reps between him and the Hyperion if he wants to stay ramped up. Uh, but the Hyperion is still taking a ton of damage. I just don't know if he's baiting. We've seen people do amazing bait tanks here in this tournament in the past and keep people going deep into hull. But this is really dangerous, even as Robin Ann in the Oracle goes down there for the fourth They're floor trying. team. They're trying so hard to keep them alive. You bet these Apox are like heating for dear life right now. I think they're in conflag range, so they can. Yeah, they're definitely in conflag range. There's an Apox sitting right there. They could still get him. Yeah, they you can see the green beams see. loaded. He there, he's in hull. There it is. That's yeah! the main that's the main DPS from the other side. Okay, now Forklift have his chance here. Forklift can maybe turn this around. They need to turn those two apocalypses around onto this Waffles team. Maybe they can get the upset here. We see Yabby in the vengeance, relatively low, but he's able to hold it. He is relatively tanky, he has a low signature, and Vice Man as well. He's going to start to be critical here, start to put down some DPS on these small tackles, kill off this Vengeance underneath the Zarmaz reps. I definitely agree with the Navy Orc attack as well. It could have gone for the Abso, which would have been an easier thing to hit, but the Navy Orc has a lot less uh, in terms of resist, so they can actually try and kill this. I might have considered maybe going for the Zarm instead, but I feel like by the time they do, they're going to lose too much of their comp. The York's going to be the oh, right the Vengeance getting snapped you down, down within seconds of each <laughs> other there. They, but, but let's keep an eye on Mr. Chuck Norris, though. He's already in three-quarters armor here. He might not be too long for this world either. And uh, the Augur and Navy issue is not dying as fast as he is. Oh, it looks like they're switching onto the Zarmaz. This is a dangerous play. If he can get I, under the Apox guns, they've got so little tackle left on the field here to hold him down. I haven't seen a single armor mod, uh, module on the Apoc. I was wondering if maybe he's hull tank, but no, he's not. He's going through hull really quickly. Like, so he's not locked for this world. He's being nooted out, actually, by the Zarm, by the way. Sorry, by Navy York, sorry. Yeah, that's that's unfortunate there. Just a no. little bit too much wasted DPS. Waffles should be able to clear it up from here, but it is still somewhat close. You can see that Zarm has now in half armor. He should have some sort of sustain. But even if he does, oh, it, it, you never know, though. This is a close one. This is deceptively close. I mean, this arm also has a, like a, quite a few rep drones on him as well. I think he's got at least one, one fl whole flight of them on him. Plus his own rep. The Zarmat is one of the tankiest uh, armor uh, logies. So he can honestly just keep himself alive before this APOC dies if he plays it right. You've got to feel for the Celestis pilot here, though, just sitting there with no guns, damping two things, feeling completely and utterly helpless as he watches his friends fight to the death around him. I also love like he's, he's trying his best to damp them out, but it doesn't matter. They're just going to go, okay, fine. I'll just get close to the APOC. What are you going to do? It's an yeah. APOC with lasers. <laughs> yeah, we're going to break really locks. Stuck? Yeah, exactly. But, <laughs> but, you know, we can see there, Sinar slowly, slowly bleeding armor. The Zarmaz doesn't even look like he's in trouble anymore. Oh, this is a yeah, really slow. good cleanup from Waffles. Surgical victory here, not getting caught by anything else not rushing after that Orthrus and just taking out what is going to give Forklift the route back into the victory, which was those two apocalypses. Yeah, it definitely like worked. They tried the headshot we saw uh, yesterday with these arms. Sorry, not arms. Apoch just killing off a Hyperion. But it just, the problem is once they got past the big ships, what do you shoot with big lasers? There's not really much yeah. of the Tricon cruisers. Good luck. Yeah, if that Vengeance had survived maybe, or if they'd been able to keep some of those Oracles alive, they would have had a chance maybe at the end the final stretch. But really, it was a good showing for them. They made this as close as they possibly could have once these ma once these uh, comps landed on the grid. Yep, run, Rasta Inat, run! <laughs> You're being targeted. Get out of there, buddy! <laughs> he's trying. <laughs> he's actually trying. I think he's actually AB fit. So do you expect to see any more of these kind of uh, all DPS, no logistics comps, these all-in, almost, uh, you know, 
comps that are trying to rush and headshot a uh, key part of their opponent's comp, like the Zarmaz in this case. Do you think we're going to see some more of those going forwards? Almost definitely, but I suspect we're going to see less with attack battle cruisers. Like, I'm um, calling this entirely out of the blue. I feel like we're going to see more ships with, with spared drone bays just to put out more rep drones, just sort of like a backup logic, if that makes sense. I suspect oh, we're yeah. going to see less assault battle cruisers. Yeah, no, for sure. All of these kinds of. Uh... All rep drones are just so useful. They just allow you to have that little tiny bit of sustain that can keep things alive. There we see the Celestis going down, leaving just the Orthrus of Viceman to run down the clock here. We've got four minutes left. Oh, and he has boundaried. Glorious. Glory. Thank you. Saved us all the time. So with that, we will take it back to the studio. Okay, Wait, listen, no, listen no, I'm no, gonna no, do this, no. I'm gonna do this one time, okay? They are only doing 1000 DPS from the... You're winning this game. Provided this f stays alive. If this guy doesn't stay alive, then suddenly you lose that race. But it's not a lemon, I'm just like... Hey, it's an 800 man. DPS lemon. It's not... Is that the one you were shooting friendlies, or...? No, that's not the one I was shooting friendlies. So. The one you were shooting friendlies is the game we won. Should I save this? I think I should just save it. Yeah, I think you should save it. Entitled lemon... I think we're gonna save it. <clears throat> lemon theory. <laughs> And welcome back. Um, we just uh, saw that interesting game there between uh, Focus Stairs, Hike Off, and Waffles. So, um, Jinten, any like closing comments there? Do you think there was a point in that Celestis being there? Uh, that was that's kind of what we were we were hoping we could maybe get Void Marts to uh, elaborate on, but he left local before we could ask him. Uh, maybe he'll be able to enlighten us in Twitch chat. But yeah, as you saw, kind of at the end there, it just it wasn't able to have the impact in the closing. Uh, the closing stages of the map that maybe it could have. My assumption is that it was probably there with like scan res damps and they were trying to make sure that the logistics couldn't lock something early so that they could snipe something with the Apox before it got transversal. That would be my like immediate assumption. But I don't know, you know, that's that's my assumption based on how the meta was like a year ago. So, Jujak, um, we kind of saw almost a similar thing happen, just a different end result. Why do you think they weren't able to kill the Hyperion with their articles in Double Apoc? Well, first of all, they have more immediate DPS threat against the Oracle. They killed their Oracle opponent faster. We had to rely on drones getting there in time. And secondly, I think perhaps... Um, we saw the Hyperion tank a little bit more towards the start. I'm not actually sure if uh, he might have uh, run out of Ansel charges for his uh, Ansel wrapper in the time, because I died before I finished grabbing. Mm. I, I think something else that also happened, we saw a tiny bit of split damage there um, happening on the lighter tackle. I, I think also the authors was, um, you know, a thought like, hey, after we saw what happened yesterday, the oracles and the epoch, they got this in the bag. Let me go for small uh, frags. But, you know, th that authors might have just given them an edge to push through that epoch in the beginning. Um, but uh, Wingnut, I think there something you mentioned yesterday was just the presence of those organ navies as well. Oh, they're very tanky ships. They're probably one of the few ships I like to merge with a Zarmad because they just have sheer buffer. If, you have, if you're going to bring a Zarmad, you need ships with enough EHP to survive until the Zarm actually matters. Because mm. we've seen people try and bring it with other ships. It just doesn't work. You need to have the buffer to really survive. And you know, Org navies mixed with a couple of battleships, maybe a battlecruiser, that can actually do it. Everything else, yeah. no. Yeah, I think raw HP wise, um, an Orc Navy actually has more HP um, than an Absolution. Resist wise, I think the Absolution just ekes it out a bit, but they're actually quite comparable uh, due to an Orc Navy having a raw HP bonus. Um, so that's also generally why, well, actually, uh, Jintan, why would you see uh, an Orc Navy in a polarized setup? You see the Orc Navy in a polarized setup because it just has 
as you said, that raw HP bonus, and obviously a polarized a polarized setup specifically is using polarized weapons, so they have no resists. Therefore, raw HP, raw HP, which is what you get bonus to on the Org Navy, is the most important thing to get. So by doing that, you're maximizing the impact that you can have with the polarized weapons whilst minimizing the drawback. As in addition to that, pulse lasers are generally one of the best things to use when it comes to the polarized weapon systems as being able to use utilize t2 scorch with a massive damage bonus is so so powerful mm, that's definitely true um how then i'd want to ask you uh the, this play we kind of saw in the beginning that was happening with the um i, I think i suspect it was the authors um kind of doing his own thing I, is that something which you consider a viable tactic where something with like rapid lights just goes and does his own thing during the match yeah we've absolutely seen it in the past when uh, rapid lights were at the most powerful we used to see these rapid light kite setups with um you know, like double Cerberus, double Orthrus, and they would be able to kind of pull around the arena, kill off all your opponent's small tackle, go in, get a points advantage, and then just make sure that you're safe for the rest of the match. And whilst that's become less and less possible uh, possible over time with the repeated nerfs to rapid lights, you can still see some of that strategy being utilized in the small scale as part of an effective setup, I think. They just need to be exceptionally good pilots and the setup needs to be built around it. In this case, I think the idea was that you use that to stop the light tackle, which can screen off your tier three battle cruisers. But if your opponents don't bring that or they bring one really tanky one in the case of this vengeance, it's not that effective. Hmm. Um, so... Oh, their Orthrus was apparently heavy missile, though. So that means that this is basically just... That makes it just a really, really kitey, long-range damage system that can apply relatively well to cruisers. So maybe this whole setup was sort of designed as a logi headshot. Could have been, but I... Could rapid lights for that. If you're going to headshot, you need quick damage. That's what rapid lights do best. I, I don't get I that. think people do like to have, like, the... So I say bombardment of you know crews, heavies, and so on for like consistent pressure. Um, but I, I do agree with you actually. They wingnut. Um, and actually speaking about the logi headshot, and so wingnut. Do you think it was a good decision for them to go for the org navy instead of the zarm as soon as that hype died? It's a hard call to make because they've got no logi of their own. So the idea is to kind of kill as much DPS as possible so that they can then survive later on. If they have enough DPS to just ignore the zarm and just sort of obliterate a ship. You got to go for it. But if you're going to go for the Zarm, it has to be the first ship. You don't do that second, you do it first. Remove that logic ASAP and then kill off the other stuff. It's it's a hard call to make. You have to kind of decide what do you value more right now? You know, killing their DPS, they can't kill you, or killing their logic so you can actually kill the DPS. Mm -hmm. So, ha Howling Wind, um, do you have comments on like, was that Zarm being the logic actually effective for counter, or could like any other logic have been there? Uh, I think uh, I think in this case the Zarm worked out pretty well, uh, just because uh, you know the, the longer range on the reps from the Zarm um, without the fall off means it could sit way further back, keep good transversal, and uh, there just wasn't a ton of tackle to go out and grab it, um, and and then it all died anyway. So it was kind of kind of like free reign to burn around, and uh, I think in this case it worked out pretty well. I mean, it, it could have been done with other logic, but um, in this case I think the Zarm. You know, it's kind of... Well, we were talking earlier, actually, the one ship that actually stopped it from being able to do that was the Celestis, was damping, I think, the whole time. So I think yeah, know, having the range if... didn't actually help at that point. And then he, he yeah, sorry, time. he like burned in later um, to get kind of closer. Yeah. Um, once there was less tackle, he, he just... So sort the of... is still terrible. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, well, we, do, we do have the bands in for this next match, by the way, if we want to talk about them. Oh, we can go ahead. So next up, we're going to be having Wolves Among Us and uh, versus Odin's voicemail. So Jinten, you can go over those bands along then. Yeah, Wolves Among Us here have banned the Rook, Falcon, and Ata uh, Tanner and Balgorn. Uh, whilst on the other side, Odin's voicemail have banned the Curse, Dominix, Atana, and Blackbird. And obviously, the first thing that stands out there is the double Atana ban. Why particularly do you think both of these teams are keen to not see an Atana on the field? Well, I think the Atana 
being the 180 ship where Veladin's tournament has been making some really strong uh, shield comps. We saw it have a strong presence uh, about a week ago on the second day of the first weekend. Um, less so yesterday because uh, I think teams were catching on to it being strong and banning it. Um, it having a extra mid and extra low over a basilisk. I think it might have better reps as well. But yeah, that's for sure. The other thing that also stands out to me here is the Rook Falcon ban. I think this might be the first time we're seeing the double uh, recon ban for the ECM side. Why would people be doing that wing nut? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> the fact, they didn't ban at the Blackbird instead, which is the more common one to use. And then the, the opposing team did it for them. I don't get I, I think actually ban, that's what's really happened really here is that um Wolves Among Us uh you know might actually have been planning to use the Blackbird themselves and thought, you know, um Let's ban just the Rook and Falcon because we still don't want to see ECM, even though we might be bringing it. And then with that bonus ban, Odin's voicemail might have been seeing this happening and then gone for the Blackbird instead, um, thinking that's what you know Wolves Among Us might have been bringing here now. And we're still okay. The teams have been moved into systems, so we'll be waiting for them to arrive soon. Um, so Jintan, do you think the curse lives up to the hype it's getting from all these bans? Um, I'm not sure. They're like sometimes you when you do get kind of later on in a tournament, you get to the point where everyone's just practicing with comps under the assumption that the curse is going to be banned, that you end up in this the situation where at a certain point the curse isn't actually that effective against you and you can leave it unbanned, but teams are just so worried about doing it that they'll ban it anyway. I don't know if that if we're in that situation or not. We'll kind of have to wait to see what happens when someone lets a curse go through, because you know it's gonna happen at some point. Yeah, I, I do agree with that. You know, I think we had it happen a bit for the Alliance Opens where um, Bargas was certainly strong, but, you know, it also just ended up being on a lot of bands. And, you know, eventually you also just get to the comp where it's like, you know, actually, if you just let it through and go for a Mimitar Rush, you're actually not that concerned anymore. So, um, you know, things start, to, you start out in the season of a tournament, think something strong and just the fact that, you know, you've been not playing it constantly, you don't actually realize what the weaknesses it has. Um, so Dominic's been as well with the Belgorn. I'm not too sure on the Belgorn ban these days. The Belgorn has been feeling a bit lackluster to me. I'm not sure, Jujak, if you think that the Belgorn is such a threat in this uh, smaller tournament for format. I think it might have been a little bit priced out. I, the one of the things that I really love about every new tournament is how the meta can be shaken up by just making a ship cost more points. Like, it's in all the previous seasons we've looked at battleships as big, powerful ships, and the faction versions have been barely more expensive. But now you even have command ships in between regular battleships and faction battleships and pirate faction battleships being even more expensive than that. A lot of our planning in this tournament went around looking at, well, they could take a Balgorn, but then they can't have anything else to go with it. Mm, that's a, I think that's also why we were maybe a bit surprised about these Rook Falcons bans is um, normally why you wouldn't ban these ships is, you know, it's like, okay, cool, you can take it, but because you've taken the more expensive option now, you can't take the rest of the core that fits around it. So that is a uh, good point you have there, is you know these more expensively priced ships, they're, they're threats for sure, um, but they can take the one threat and then they just end up crippling the rest of their comp. Um, I, I think we might have seen it happen yesterday when, um, I'm not sure who it was exactly of the Vajra Hydra, uh, sorry, Volta in Warlords game who took the it was uh Volta who took the Lashak and ended up losing against Warlords of the Deep. So I think that also might have been a case of them spending all their points on the top heavy side and then maybe gimping themselves all the rest. Um but we do have the teams arriving here in the arena now, so we'll be switching over shortly to have myself and Jujak commentate this game. All right, and we're in the arena here with uh, Wolves Among Us versus Odin's voicemail. Jujak, if you can go over what we've seen on both sides, please. Well, speaking of Lashaks, we have uh, a Lashak, double Vexer, Confessor, Pontifex, double Deacon, going up against double Absolution, Ikatursa, Heretic, Neros, and double Punisher. 
<laughs> I, I've been having having this happen a lot to me like when we speak about a ship and lo and behold it shows its face but it's going to be interesting um, I think I'm not too sure if we've been seeing the Icky Tursa too much we've been seeing a bunch of Nurgles but the Icky Tursa is also going to be interesting for me so it's going to be the Hack versus the Battleship um, I'll be interested to see where they apply their DPS but um, it's also going to be a case of Frig Logi versus T2 Cruiser Logi um, which one do you think is going to come ahead on the Logi wise like why would they have gone for those decisions there well, in the smaller format, I feel like sometimes it feels safer flying a Logi Cruiser because there just isn't a there aren't as many ships that can go out and tackle you. Like we see some comps where you might actually have four mainline damaging ships and you can just zoom away. But here we see uh, the Odin's voicemail going straight onto a Confessor and... Uh, the Leshak Ishtar is going for the Neros of the opposing team. Yeah, as the match kicked off, there was the Confessor of uh, Soldiers just charging right away, but um, looks like the communication was on point, so the Frigolati team on his side had him covered, although he just has to be careful he doesn't charge too far away, as we do see the Oneros of Tiger Ven um, getting some damage there. He is actually in the back line there, but the Leshak of Hoffi has charged in as well to start spooling on him. Yeah, um, you've got a drone cloud following after him, a whole bunch of light armor maintenance bots, and the, main, the medium armor maintenance bots are about to catch up to him, so he's getting a little bit of help to stay alive, but it's scary being on the narrows in this situation. I would say, and they, they had definitely doing a good job to screen the, the shack away, so while he is still able to apply DPS, it looks like they switched over now, the, the shack is starting to spool on Melinda, um, they definitely want to keep the, sh the shack away from whatever's prime, because he will definitely have a smart bomb in his highs right now. Yeah, I, I love getting all the, all the utility of uh, one big ship with the uh, newts and smart bombs if you want it. So uh, Melinda is taking a lot of damage here, and... Um, the Neros at least has something to do keeping himself alive and Melinda alive. Yeah, so we see Berserker 2's out right now. I believe those are from the combination of the Ishtars. Um, they've moved away from Melinda there and gone on to, back onto the Oneros, so I'm not sure if they're considering a split tactic here while the Shack will be spooling on the Absolution while they're applying to the Oneros now of Tiger, who has been tackled. So um, they're going to see if they could probably get two kills at once here right now, but uh, they're trying to get off the tackle. Uh, Ishtar of Espac has him tackled now, but both Ishtars are now on him, so even if they manage to clear off one, he's still stuck there right now. Yeah, one of the things that I find interesting for the Odin's um, team is what you actually kill when your opponent has a lot of very high resilience smaller ships. There's not re really an obvious choice for them, as Tiger Ven is taking a lot of damage here. Yeah, and it looks like they're definitely going to go for that split here. So the, the Shack of Hafi has been spooling on Melinda, and as soon as that the Honiris is down, the, all that damage is hitting him. So um, looking really good here now for Wolves, I would say. Um, they just pretty much have to clean up. There's still the potential for them to lose some light stuff if these uh, these Deacons might get some pressure now. But but I'd say they're in a pretty comfortable position at, at this point. Yeah, and Lashaks are monstrously tanky to begin with. I I always felt it was very difficult to pick the right target if you have nothing very obvious to go for. Like, chewing through a Lashak is perhaps what the Wolves team are expecting people to do, since it's the only large thing that they're presenting their opponent. The Ekaterisa is um, just having a fun time right now, flying around, I'd say. But um, the one thing I was surprised about at the beginning is, um, well, Wolves were doing a, a, like trying to go for Logi, understanding that it was a threat to them. Um, and then, you know, once they maybe got screened off, looking for the damage elsewhere, going for the Abso, and then as soon as the nearest presented itself, they went for it. Um, but I don't think Lupus, oh, sorry, I mean, uh, Odin made any... Uh, attempt onto these deacons until right until it was pretty much too late. So, uh, do you, do you think they their comp would have had issues actually applying to these deacons, Jujak? Yes, actually, like have, we flew a lot with um, with ten MN uh, frigate launchy, and that's really one of the things that it, it's a lot more scary in this tournament with tech two uh, damage drones, but. 
they're slippery. They're hard to pin down a lot of the time. Like their main weakness is obviously the rep range. They have to go in close a lot of the time if you want to really keep something alive. But if they're not forced to do that, then they can happily do their humongous turns around the arena as close as they can safely go. And it's hard to apply to them, especially with with uh, absolutions who have few mid slots to pick up all the tracking they want and all the utility they want as well. Yeah, so we'll see uh, Lupus chasing down this last Ikitursis while the Ishtar of Espax is getting a bit low. It looks like he might have overextended a bit to chase the Ikitursis and the Deacons have had trouble catching up, but they're getting onto him now, applying the reps. So it looks like Lupus is trying to go and make the wants to keep this a clean sweep. Um, we'll see if they manage to uh, get the Ikitursis of Vulcan as there is about five minutes left in the game. Um, as long as they don't uh, mess around too much, they'll definitely keep their clean record here um but it is worth mentioning as the match did kick off the ishtars of the lupus team uh, dropped bouncers right away so along with the uh, extreme range that the shack can get on his triglavian uh, weapons um they were able to also apply all that damage right up from the bat um as well to all those heavy targets you said that were pre presented to them on the odin side and then once they could get a bit closer they could um, you know abandon drones and switch to other things um making use of these ishtars to a uh, form of heavy tackle which probably also meant that um well actually jujak what makes a ishtar good here as heavy tackle well they have mids that is one of the things that is very nice about a tackle ship. Like, one of the reasons why Punishers, despite being incredibly tanky and incredibly small, they cannot actually fit a web and a scram, whereas Ishtars have the ability to have both a web and a scram and a newt to help them with the tackling job that they have to do. And definitely flying an Aneros when you're being webbed and scrammed and newted, it just makes everything a lot more difficult you have more things to worry about as you're trying to get away like cap management and all of the things that come with that and we see wills among us taking a clean victory here off of odin's voicemail and with that we'll go back to the studio Hi. Clearly, I'm not the real Brisk Ball. But sometimes it's not so easy to know what's real and what's fake. When on Reddit, check your facts. Drink quaff. This message was paid for and sponsored by Quaff. Now introducing Quaff Glow, the incandescent beverage. And welcome back. We have just seen the victory there of uh, Wolves Among Us over Odin's voicemail. Uh, Wolves Among Us having a clean sweep here. Wingnut, any comments on the game? I just want to say that's how you bring notes. I've been, I've been saying it for the past, what, two weeks now? You don't bring one note. You don't bring two heavy notes and call it good. You bring a Lashak with notes and you bring two full newt Ishtars. If you're going to bring notes, you have to commit to it. Otherwise, it does nothing. And they did. They mm -hmm. had new Ishtars go straight for that nearest near the, like near mid game, deleted his capacitor, while the Lashak was also nuding out the Absos around him. That's how you do notes. You bring enough to actually do the job. Not one. Jintan, any comments? Yeah, something else that you don't see kind of directly with newts, but you need to keep in mind as well, is how difficult they make the job of the tackle ships. Like, there is a reason you typically put your most skilled, like, mechanically pilots, it's mechanically skilled pilots in the smallest ship, and that's because they need to be able to position into such small windows to get past the negative space that's provided by newts. 
um, and be able to get to tackle down the ships that really matter. And you really saw that in that last match. You know, those two punishers just weren't able to get into the back lines, get the tackle that they needed to allow those absolutions to get in the position to break the opposing uh, the opposing team's tank before their sustain was broken through or the very peak levels of their sustain. Mm, I think that's also a good, yeah, a good point to raise on just what the newts do a lot of time people think you know it's a heavy newt it's for battleships you know it's a medium newt it's for cruisers but i mean even just a heavy newt can make a frigate's life hell I've, I've personally seen in one of my games where a vengeance of all things was just useless when a rattlesnake just applied newts to it it did nothing entire game um howling i do want to ask you um what's your experience with the tackle pilots that you've had on your team um do, do they uh, uh fly themselves into uh, their death most of the time, or uh, have they been quite skilled on your team? I think we um, we do relatively well with uh, tackle. We try and put people who kind of know what they're doing uh, in, and we try and keep people in their consistent ship types, you know, so uh, people get used to the role. Um, it is hard, though. It's hard, it's hard to be good at, get, yeah, like you said, uh, getting in there and uh, around news, around webs, around, you know, things like that. And actually uh, knowing when to go, because if you just commit too early or something, and you just die on your own, you're effectively useless. You're not really adding anything. Um, and it kind of puts you on the back foot right from the start. So it's it's being able, it's having like the self restraint to just hold back, wait for the right opportunity, and and then and then dive in correctly. I think that's certainly true as well. I, I know I've had it before where it's um, one of my DPS coolers. You know, he suddenly calls for he wants to tackle on this, and it's like nope. All the all the tackles dead. Um, you know, staying alive is a really good skill to have in tournaments. Um, so, Jujak, uh, how do you guys normally put people into ships? Do you also kind of try and stick people into one ship type or role, or are you guys flexible? We tend to have people who prefer one role over another. We've flown a lot with Logi frigates, so we have like a, a squad of uh, Logi pilots who fly that most of all, but they'll also fly um, tackle if they have to. Like large ship frig and small frigate tackle being similar-ish in like the opposite end of the same spectrum, whereas people who uh, fly the, the largest ships tend to be of a more strategic mind rather than a tactical one where they have to, um, they have more time to look around and assess the whole situation, call out weaknesses in the enemy's position or something to that effect. Hmm. All right. Um, and Jensen, I want to ask, do you think it uh, should have happened? Maybe it was like, uh, the Onir is getting caught by an Ishtar. So should that have happened? Um, I, th I think ultimately you're going to have to see how both of those ships are fit to know if they quote unquote should have happened. You know, you can start to think about, oh, you know, with this MWD, if they both activate them at the same time, are they going to land on each other? At the end of the day, what happened happened. You know, if it was down to good piloting from the Ishtar or down to good piloting from the Anira, oh, sorry, bad piloting from the Anira, so the only people who are going to know that are probably those two pilots. Um, and. What matters is that that happens more than not, is that ships that shouldn't be able to catch things can catch things. Because if you're the person who makes the move first, you turn in before someone recognizes it, you'd be surprised how easy it is to not notice if someone comes in that kind of 14, 15 kilometer range, they land that first web and suddenly you're caught. Mm, that can happen. Um, like I think I've spoken about it before. Is um, sometimes people can get tunnel vision in their role, where it's you know they start focusing more on their modules and you know especially for logic of keeping the person alive, and then whoops, something creeped up on you. Um, uh, you know, I think we might have had it where a rattlesnake even caught a logic before. Or, <laughs> um, but wing that. Like I know I was speaking now about uh, you know the potential of smart bombs on the shack, but do you think that the shack was actually fully nude fit? I don't know to be honest. I we didn't see him smart bomb once, but there was no really any drones near him for that, that to ever matter. Maybe he had a smart bomb. I mean, having one large is all you really need. So maybe he had a smart bomb, but we just didn't see him use it. I suspect he might have had one. Yeah, it probably would come. I did see when the the whole cluster of whatever was happening around the nearest um, even though Ikatur was tackled off, he he was firing his smart bomb because <laughs> his like Ishars were firing his smart bomb. So there was like a mini smart bomb war happening around where the nearest was. Um, so people definitely taking that to heart. Um, so Howling, I want to ask you: Have you had bad experiences where you just uh, had the wrong utility fit and just wanted to kick yourself in the foot? Oh, kick yourself in the head, or 
I think, uh, yeah, I mean, to be honest, is sometimes when uh, when we set up right, uh, for a particular comp, and then I think that's, that's really what happened to us uh, in our first match. We went in with this, you know, great idea of using TDs and, and stuff to keep people, keep the, in, in this case, it was uh, Naga shooting us. And uh, it just ended up not being not being like the right comp. And and looking back, it's just frustrating to be on grid, and 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 also like post game looking at it and just going like, I don't know what we could have done <laughs> to win it, you know. Uh, and especially with the DPS races, I think it, that's quite frustrating when you when you go in with kind of like a counterplay in mind, and then it's just like, oh no, you're just getting DPS through, and uh, and and that's it. So that that can be pretty frustrating. Yeah. Can definitely understand it's just um like you say a bit demoralizing maybe get on grid and that happens with you uh but next up we're also going to be having ap stole my fit versus spectre fleet we're still waiting for those teams to get ready but uh we have their band submitted in advance so wingnut if you can go over their bands for me please yes these bands are actually quite interesting uh ap stole my fit banning out atana zamet and onero so that's all of the good technology i don't know why that's in that list and the Spectre Fleet banning out Hyperion, Slepnir, Blackbird. So that's interesting, like, Rush ban, as well as the Blackbird ban. But AP stole my fit with those, like, T2 armor and the uh, Atana ban. I know I'm just randomly spitballing, but I, I don't know why I'm thinking we're going to see a Fly Killer. I don't know why. Or at least a Shield Kaidi. I could be very wrong. I, I just, I have a feeling, man. I got a feeling. Yeah, these are kind of just power bands, aren't they? they these are just good ships. There's, there doesn't seem to be any coherent strategy behind it, which does make it seem like, you know, you're just putting in the bands that you want to to allow you to use a really good setup like that. But it also does mean that the curse is open. Don't forget that. <laughs> as well as the healer. I, mean, I, mean, I don't healer, think we've seen much of a healer. Uh, um, I do want to ask now, uh, for Jujag, do, do you think now... They, they banned the Tana, but that does leave, obviously, the Scimitar and Abassi open. Let's say more specifically Abassi. Do you think Abassi is a substitute for a good comp if you have the... Where one should take the Tana, but now it's banned? We actually tried to simulate flying uh, an Atana on, um, on um, CC because we wanted to feel what those comps were like without having access to one. And our con conclusion was that in order to simulate um, an Atana with Basilisks, you actually need two. One that just reps and one that just tanks, because the extra mid and the extra low makes all the difference to that power. Having buffer and a stealth rep for the ship is just... like The Basilisk just feels so weak if you can't feed it to Cap in any way, shape or form. So it's pretty much once the Atana's banned, it's like, nah, we're not even going to try for Bassi? The Bassi and the um, Scimitar are also very large ships and easy to kill at range if you can... Like, you don't... Like, an Oneros is not going to die at range if it's not tackled to a lot of weapon systems, whereas a shield ship might just die. And since they're relying on Ansel Reppers to rep them, at some point, they've just taken as much damage as they can, and then they stop repping and die as well. So, Howling, I want to ask you, um, we see the Zarm and the Anira span. Is there a reason they would have left the Guardian open? I, I guess um, there's, a, there's a chance maybe uh, that they're, they're going to do something with uh, maybe like remote cap onto a Guardian, or, or even just a Guardian, and use like heavy drones to keep it alive, and just you know have it close. Uh, that's that's always a possibility, um, and that could be pretty interesting. If if I'm not sure how the points work exactly uh, for a comp like this, but maybe you could do like have like a widow uh, and a guardian run the armor widow comp like the, uh, we saw yesterday, and just have it like cap transfer in the guardian. That would be uh, fairly interesting. Oh yeah, but like who knows? Maybe that's why they've left the curse open because they you know think they can do something with um, ETs. Uh... Maybe we see something like that. It'll be interesting to see because in this tournament, we've actually disallowed energy transfers of, on anything except the logistics. Um, but oh. we do have the teams actually warping warping into the uh, arena now. So we'll be handing it off for to Jintan and Howling to commentate on this game.
Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Anger Games Arena. I'm Yin Tan, and we have a wonderful match here for you with Spectre Fleet going up against AP Stole My Fit. How are you doing today, uh, my fellow commentator Howling? Hey, doing good, thanks. Yourself? Yeah, and today we've got some amazing combat lined up because, as you can see, Spectre Fleet have decided to show that they're no cowards. They walked in at zero with this triple apocalypse setup. Oh, sorry, no, a uh, double apocalypse setup with uh, two apocalypses, an organ navy issue, and an oracle all near the beacon and ready to pump out DPS of their opponents. And what have AP Stole My Fit brought? Well, they've got their, their Vindicator, uh, Abso Rediva, Double Norg, uh, Vengeance Claw, which is a, a really nice comp. Um, that Vindy is going to do some work, I reckon. Yeah, the interesting thing to watch here is that Rodiva, because that's the T1 version of the Zarmaz. We don't often see that. It's very low EHP, but it does still have a huge rep potential. We're coming down here to the start of the match one second ago. Let's see what gets shot at first. That Claw diving in on the Oracles right there. Yeah, what, can, what do you think that Claw's going for? Uh, looks like he's actually going right past to the Manticore. Maybe getting some tackle on him. Try and clear some DPS off the... Or hold so that the DPS can clear it. Yeah, it looks very much like there's a tackle war in progress right now, but there we go. Tin Baron in the Rediva taking a ton of damage. Like I said, he's going to have very, very low tank. He's got a lot of uh, a lot of EHP a second he can put out in reps, but not much of it that he can do to keep himself alive. He needs to keep burning, and these Apocalypses are still doing tons of damage. He's, he's 120 kilometers away from me now. He's getting very close to the edge, even as that Manticore dies. There's every card to, to get boundary, boundary right here. Well, this does show the uh, effectiveness of the long-range trigger rep here, that he doesn't have to be within, like, 30 to do decent reps on his team. No, he just needs to keep them active. We can see that more power in the uh, Organ Avia Sheep, respectively, is already at half armor, and that's where most of his EHP is going to be. There's no logistics here on the Spectre Fleet side. They need to get a kill somewhere. They spent so much time shooting that Rediva, they nearly killed him, but they weren't able to push through, and they've lost a ship and nearly a second one whilst doing that. Yeah, I think they need to try and fo yeah keep focusing on this Vindy, try and get him down. Well, but meanwhile, that that Navy Org is just instantly dead, basically. The, the Vindy web is just so strong. Yep, Faffy Waffy here in half armor. He's got some active reps going on as well, or possibly even reps from Tin Baron. Yeah, no, sorry, it's a mixture of both. Looks like active reps and the mutagen from that Rodiva. He's going to be taking. He's going to be really, really hard to kill here, even with all this firepower focused onto him. So that they're going for the Oracle now. Yeah, it does. It looks like they are. And, you know, that Rediva, is, again, it's in half HP. It's come back from the edge of glory. Now it's 75 km kilometers from the center of the arena. but And damage is starting to get spread across the SF team, but that isn't as big of a problem as it normally is because oh, they the don't Rediva's have any logistics to top it up. Oh, the Rediva's in hull. There we go. He's that down. low HP, it's down. Yeah. There we go, respectively having a chance here right at the end. Both of their apocalypses are still upright. That oracle is going into hull. There we go. Yeah, they're clearing out the wrong long range DPS pretty quickly, though. So I think um, they might be able to squeeze this out. This is going to be a really interesting uh, struggle here. What are the crucial ships at play here for us? Well, I mean, the, the thing is, the, the, the um, they still have the uh, the double double apoc uh, navy org oracle, which is just all long range DPS still on grid. So, I think that the kind of what they've lost is is is, is kind of you know they can lose it and still apply really well and still do tons of damage. So, their team is still looking pretty decent, although they are burning, getting burned through pretty quickly. Yeah, you can see that the Vindicator of Faffy Waffy in Hull, even as the Oracle enters Hull from uh, Spectre Fleet. This is a real DPS race now at this point, but it looks and like split damage as well. Yeah, if we actually look at the HP graphs from both sides, it looks like AP are ahead just in raw EHP, so they should have an advantage here. But it's a question of can they apply all that Vindicator, uh, sorry, the rest of their DPS effectively. I think once they uh, once they clear this Navy Org, uh, they need to focus on Leo and the APOC and try and get him out as fast as possible before this Abso goes down. Or are they going to run into an issue of just not having a lot more DPS to clear anything? Although, of course, with no tackle, these uh, APOCs are going to struggle to apply. I don't know about that. The APOC does have a decent tracking bonus. If you can transversal match well, you can still hit cruisers, and they're especially not going to struggle with this absolution. That thing has the signature of a large barn. 
It's just a question now of who, who dies first. They're almost neck and neck at this point. Demesius Kadesh and Leo Dormi both n niggling down, getting down there right into the lowest sense of structure. <laughs> I'm really little. <laughs> it's going to be so that close. Was a, was and then it becomes an even points match, doesn't it, between the battleship and all of the rest that remains. There we go. The, the Absolution goes down first. I think he got another shot of boosts off, though, so he's going to be still having this lingering impact on the rest of the team, even after Leo goes down. So now it's a question of what can they do in this power play moment? They've all got all these bonuses stacked up from those boosts. Can they put them to work and take Virian down before time goes out here? An easy 1v4. So let's see. They're shooting uh, Juan right now. He has to burn right across the field whilst having basically terrible transversal on the Apox B. He's going to take tons of damage doing it. You can see there that the Claw sitting at zero, the Vengeance sitting at zero, just orbiting it, making sure it can't move, allowing these Augur and Navies to take the perfect positioning they can. And even with that, that Augur and Navy issue of Juan, he's still taking damage, even as Virion takes some of his own. He's picking up Transversal now, so we'll see if he can shrug off some of that DPS. Yeah, it doesn't look like he has... No, he has a couple of drones left. He has a couple of Valkyrie 2s, so he's still got a couple of... Uh, he's still got something to maybe do things to this tackle, maybe push it off, make it back off a little bit. I don't know, though. This is this is a really tense fight here, a really tense fight, and we just got to watch and see what the HP bars would do. You can see that Virion is taking so, so little damage right now. They're applying next to nothing to him. I think that's the problem. The, the Navy Augurs are, are so far away to try and reduce the damage on them that they're just not. There's no DPS to apply to the uh, to the Apoc. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to break out the points uh, list here in a moment if I'm not <laughs> careful, just to see who's going to win. Who's? Uh, okay, it looks like AP are actually ahead on points, not Spec to Fleet. So it is really up to Virgin here. He needs to score a kill in these last four minutes of the game, or uh, AP are going to take it purely on points. It's a boring way to win, but it is a way to win. And we yeah, can't fault them for that. Yeah, you I can see these... that Juan is even regenerating a tiny little bit of shields. Looks like Virion might be stuck high and dry, surrounded by two frigates and kept away from any other action. I think that's the best play here. They just need to stay on the other side of the arena, keep him locked down with the, the tackle and just sit here and wait the time out, you know? Yeah, like I said, it's not, not the most exciting way of uh, uh, winning, but, you know... Got to do what you got to do. For sure. You know, a little bit more damage there went on to Desti, but um, it's even hard to see what he's shooting at right now. Oh, it looks like he's trying to shoot the claw, just hoping for that one wrecking shot and that it would be enough to kill him. It probably would be. It doesn't even look like the claw is moving that much. Yeah, there must be a grapple. He's, he's very slow, but uh, even though even then, I think uh, any kind of decent transversal on an interceptor that close just... It's extremely unlikely he'll get hit, and there's well, no, he... no drones to worry about. Well, I'm sure Virian right now would not do for a give of drop for a drip uh, for, uh, for a drop of drip ah uh, at the tracking <laughs> drug. You know what I mean. Good bit of drop, yeah. <laughs> well, it looks like uh, Juan has found some safety on that jump beacon over there, just in case you never know what happens. Yeah, and you can see even here, Virion's in three quarters armor. There's a chance he doesn't even survive to the end of this match. Yeah, this uh, Vengeance doing uh, <laughs> tons of damage, it turns out, over time. It's going to get a nice uh, solo kill, huh? Oh, yeah, you know, it's elite, elite PvP. Oh, wow, there we go. The Vengeance suddenly Amazing. taking a huge chunk of damage, though. If it's going to turn out that he could have been killing the Vengeance all this time, he's going to feel very silly. But I yeah, think I he think... might have just caught him in a moment of uh, laxity there. Yeah, I think the Vengeance wasn't moving so much, or a bad orbit switch or something like that, and got the uh, heavy web on him. Mm -hmm. Looks like he's doing okay now, though. Picked up some trans. Yeah, and he's in, uh... he's in hull. This is going to be it, guys. Place your bets. Does he even survive to the end of the match? I'm going for no. What a way to win, eh? It's. I mean, they're gonna they're gonna make it a kill. It's just gonna, the slowest kill known to mankind, taking it the safest route, and we can't blame them for that. The Apoc can't even edge of glory. Yeah, trapped, pick pecked to death by a few frigates. Oh, 
Uh, you know, what do you, you What do you think they could have done to maybe turn us around? Honestly, I think this was so close that all you would have needed was a couple of extra cycles from, you know, one gun here on the right target there, and you probably would have had a victory here from Spectrefleet. They took it so close to the end, even here. You know, if that Vengeance had gotten a second shot off, there was every chance that suddenly it's going to take them a lot longer. They have to pull the old navies in, and oh, you know, you know how things go. Yeah, it's, it's a house of cards. But anyway, with all that said, let's take it back to our own house of cards in the studio. On a silver platter, if this goes down, he can't do anything. This wild card is kind of jammed by a single Griffin. This is the brave story right here, right now. And welcome back. We just saw AP Storm Effort take the wing there, uh, win there on time. Um, well, also technically managed to kill the APOC there, but uh, they pretty much had that secure, doing the right move there to just keep that APOC away from everything else. Uh, Wingnut, any comments there on the game? Not particularly. Like, once it got to the end there, there was only like a battleship versus small stuff. He was screwed. <laughs> You can you can pray desperately your large lasers are going to hit things, but it's not going to happen. That comp's really good at just headshotting big stuff. And that's really all it's good for. Speaking of that, like, I'm just wondering about their target choice in the opening moments of the game there. I mean, Jujak, do you have any uh, comments on what they were shooting? Like, I thought they were going to go for the Vindy. We lost our first match to not killing a Rodiva, so I would have expected them to just go straight for the Hyperion that they are guaranteed to hit. Especially when they can um, get it, get Do in the damage the before the ramp up. Uh, you yeah, mean the Vindicator attack, right? Yeah, yeah. The Vindic yeah. Yeah, like the one thing that stood out for me there is um, as well was the Vindy seemed to be quite evasive in that match. Um, normally you'd uh, expect a Vindy to get in close with its webs, but um, it seemed like the Vindy was actually a bit scared to get close to anything. Um, only really getting in the closer targets once the Rodiva had died. Um, Jinsen, do, do you have any idea why Vindy might be running away from things? <laughs> Um, I think in this kind of a matchup, it almost makes sense because you're trying to, you know, like, you are the team with by far the the sustained advantage. You have the logistics, your opponents don't. During the early points in the match, your logistics were able to get extremely far away. So you don't, but it burnt a lot of resources to do that. So you don't want to put your logistics under pressure by getting tackled at zero and hit with the entire enemy team's DPS. So I think there is some sense into using your Vindicator a bit more evasively, taking advantage of its high agility and kind of fighting on the edge of web range. Because, you know, mm -hmm. it does have 90% uh, webs up to, you know, 15 kilometers with heat. You can utilize it from a distance, even if it doesn't do max DPS from there. Yeah, that's true, because most battleships uh, might uh, go for grapple, whereas obviously the Vindy, being a serpentine ship, has that bonus on its webs. Uh, but Howling, um, so when you... Um, do you have a choice of assault frigates that you prefer in these kind of matches? Because people have been going for uh, the Vengeance or the Enyo or, who knows, maybe an Ishker. I think Vengeance is just a really strong choice. You know, it's uh, it's uh, tons of tons of tank, and, uh, and also you get the sort of the DPS on top of that is just sort of the cherry on top. Um, that's I think that's a, a pretty good all-rounder armor um, assault frigate for for that kind of stuff. And and for shield like harpy um, again for the resist bonus is is really strong. Um, and and you still get the blasters and 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 things like that. So and and also if you need to you can book it out there with like a you know they're they're all fast nimble ships so really strong ships. Another advantage of the Vengeance specifically is that its um, weapon systems don't require capacitor, being a rocket ship, which is quite rare for the Amar. 
Um, but and, this means that if you get muted out, you can still win tackle duels potentially. And not just that as well. It, for some reason, the Vengeance also gets a cap bonus. So it is the perfect tackle boat. Because if you get so. muted, it's got it's the mid spots and everything. I also um, love the Vengeance myself. And um, speaking also of the Vengeance there, in that game, uh, when it comes down to the points, if the APOC had managed to kill either the Vengeance or an, one of the Orgs, um, that would have put Spectre Fleet ahead on points with their one battleship remaining. Um, that's if the APOC could have survived. Unfortunately, if he managed to kill the Claw, um, he would have still been behind on points. And then speaking of the points, Jujak, when you guys are in the game, how, how do you know what's happening with points? Well... In the game, there's actually for the teams um, a point counter, uh, but you get a you get a um, feeling for it after a lot of practice. Like two battleships are worth more than say a team's general low end. Like occasionally you'll think you're ahead, and somebody who's died earlier in that match will go check it for you. <laughs> Yeah, that's always good to you know, keep the overall um, uh, strategy going for the game. The, the, the grand plan is there to get a tunnel vision there. So it helps. Um, that's generally, um, you know, when someone's removed from the game uh, and they're dead, they can still actually contribute because they actually are still on grid and able to um, be extra eyes for everyone else there. Um, but if we're going to be looking at the next, ma next match coming up, which is going to be uh, Flaming Dragons versus uh, Ramrod Shenanigans, um, Jintan, can you go over the bands we'll be seeing? Yeah, for sure. Uh, the current bands are Flaming Dragons, uh, taking out of the picture Blackbird, Atana, Vindicator, and Widow, whereas Ramrod banned out the Curse, Dominix, Blackbird, and Healer. So we've kind of conclusively got the ECM and some of the drone setups taken off the table, but a kind of wide variety of other things as well. Uh, so, Wingnut, do you think that Widow ban is validated, or do you think it's maybe a bit of a knee-jerk response to what we saw yesterday? Potentially a bit of both, I suspect. Uh, it's kind of funny, it's interesting, it's interesting that Farming Dragons bands are a bit more like directed, taking out Atan, taking out Widow, taking out Vindicator, and then the average Blackbird ban. Whereas Ramrod would just ban the average stuff. They ban Cursed, Dominic, Blackbird, Gila. I mean, that just seems like perfectly average bans for what we've been seeing the last uh, two weeks. So, yeah, one's got a target, the other one's just like, get rid of all this. I don't want any of these. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, both of them are fair strategies for this blind band system we have. Um, we've gone over it multiple times, but uh, once again, teams submit their bands ahead of time. Um, well, to the ref, uh, three bands first. Uh, the without knowing what the other teams submitted. The ref then tells them what the other teams have and if they need duplicates. And if they need duplicates, they get extra bands for those. Um, so some teams will do the targeted strategy. Some teams will just go, hey, you know what? We don't want these ships. They're just strong. General approach and go for that. We do have the teams moving into the tournament system right now. Um, Howling, do you have any thoughts on these bands that we've seen? I think they're, again, just, just fairly uh, generic bands uh, in case of the, the Logi, the Curse, things like that. Um, it's the, uh, the, uh, the Dominics is, is, again, just like, you know, really strong ship, just don't want to fight drones uh, and, and newts and smart bombs, just not interested. Uh, I guess the the widow uh, just means they don't want to they don't want to deal with um, uh, Calcif's comp, <laughs> uh, the one yesterday. Just just keep that out. Um, I think I think that it doesn't really give too much of information on what they themselves want to fly. Just just you know keep the OP comps away. Well, speaking of giving away information, then Jujak, um, when you guys do these bans, do you actually take that into account? Like, have you ever? almost gotten to a point where you metagame yourself by with these bands? Well, a lot of our bands happen to be things that we don't want to fly against. And a lot of the time, if you have limited testing time, you need to be a little bit pragmatic about not suddenly swapping in to another type of bands later. For instance, we preferred Lodgy Frigates, and Healers were a problem that we didn't really overcome in our testing, so we banned them in every one of our matches. But if we were to come further into the tournament and something else became overwhelmingly powerful, like somebody just figured out the meta and we could no longer ban the Gila, that could bite us in the ass later if that was like turned on us then. 
for instance, if if the curse meta manifested in a way that the curse and the pilgrim and say the arbitrator had to be banned every match, we'd run into problems. Okay, and with that, we'll just be taking it over to the arena now where both teams have arrived. We'll, we'll have Wingnut and myself be commentating. All right, and welcome to the arena, folks, where we have um, uh, Flaming Dragons and Ramnod Shenanigans taking uh, positions here now. Wingnut, can you go over what we've seen here on grid? Yeah, so uh, Ramnod Shenanigans bringing the Shaq Balgorn. I feel like I've seen this, I think it was in the AO, maybe even the 5v5. That is a very powerful combo, control and DPS. Then we've got Pontifex, Double Deacon, Double Purifier. And on Flaming Dragon side, we've got Eos, Aniras, Double Ishtar, Swipple, Nurgle, and Heretic. A rather eclectic Ooh. bunch, but a heavy drone emphasis for sure. Very strong drone setup. I'm going to be interested to see what if these bombers can do the worst. Unfortunately, um, with the torpedoes, you know, um, these assault uh, cruisers, heavy assault cruisers aren't the best targets, but maybe they can get rid of that Ishtar. Um, I'm not too sure how they're going to do on applying to the Onirus, but I can see bombs underneath these purifiers. So maybe um, we're going to be seeing some epic bomb plays in the beginning here. So look out for that for sure, as we do have the game kicking off right now. Definitely potential for sure. If, they, if we see these... Uh... So Ishtar has dropped sentries like we've been seeing for a while now. They might just set out a bomb and just delete them as fast as they can. At the moment, they're playing safe, not going straight in, just getting some angle so they don't die immediately. Yes, yeah, so we do have some drone. And we do have the Pontifex also creeping forward there from the um, Ramrod side. Um, but it is uh, important to note that, you know, bomb launchers are a visible high slot. So if uh, the Frame Dragon teams was paying attention, they'd be knowing that this is already uh, in waiting for them. So they could already be setting up to counter that. Um, so they already see that <laughs> these bombers are on threat and going for them. Yeah, they're going after Ishtar. I swear I'm seeing... Um... Also, I'm, I'm seeing, like, torpedoes being fired at this Ishtar by bombers, so... I don't feel like that's the right call there, boys. You might want to shoot something a bit bigger with your torpedoes. <laughs> as one of the, uh, the purifiers going into half armor now, as the Pontifex is also doing the exact same thing. It's, it's a bit of a shame, I think, that they've committed this Pontifex. Uh, or, well, actually, Pontifex literally, I think, is their only fast tackle ship that they have, and it's a bit of a shame because yep. it's committed itself to the front line there, and losing that means they're also going to be losing links, and the Deacons just aren't able to really commit as much as the Pontifex is in the front line there. Um, so we're probably going to see that going down, losing their links, and that could mean they're going to be losing the Purifier soon after that as well. There goes the Pontifex that lost their tackle. Hopefully the uh, Balgorn, no, mind, the Balgorn's not even going towards that. The Balgorn is running. Where are you going? <laughs> I, I don't know where that Balgorn's trying to go. So this is a gun ball. It looks like he's flanking around right now. I'm not too trying sure. To you know, you, yeah. That's look, yeah. Um, so some people um, kind of just click the approach button and then they end up going in this wide arc, whereas the proper move would be to look where the nearest is actually going and trying to take a manual intercept path. Although he might be trying to avoid tackle, although he's still a slow battleship and pretty much can't get caught by any of the tackle on the opposing side right now. Yeah, Leshak is currently trying to shoot a heretic at the moment while he's driving past it so i don't think he's gonna be hitting as often as he'd like and he's trying to turn it, around it, to get behind the oneros and it's I, that's not gonna work buddy you're a lashak you can't catch an oneros yeah what's what it's looking to me like now if you're looking from a top-down view it just looks like these this two battleships from the ramron side are just <laughs> playing catch up with this oneros that's just leading them around the edge of the arena right now um while the deacon side uh, on the side of ramrod also brizzy taking pressure right now which is not looking good because those oh. links are uh, brizzy ex probably expired right now and the eos of uh, lord midge just got caught and webbed down by the balgorn balgorn's definitely got him webbed down that the leshek's got to turn around now and i think he is Yep, Lashak's turning Did he get caught or was the strategic bait? I mean, either rule doesn't matter. They, not that like Lashak's really have much of a choice in the matter. Uh, Lashak's yeah, oh. spooling up can definitely kill this thing for sure. And there goes one of the bombers, uh, one of the deacons, sorry. Yeah, one of the deacons definitely going down there, as you said, and uh, we're probably going to see the other one shorten, uh, falling shortly, but the EOS is definitely getting a lot of pressure now as um, it's going to have a the shack spooling onto it. That's slowly going to get worse and worse and worse. Um, so the Neros might have to start creeping in, which means uh, that could set it up for the Belgorn to catch him. And these bombers are going to die remarkably quickly. They need to overheat their the torpedoes and just burn them out before they die because this EOS is the one target they can actually kill. There goes the last deacon. See the Lashak also firing off smart bombs to remove the, uh, I think that's one set of Logi drones on that EOS. EOS is purely being sustained by self-rep and potentially even some reps from the uh, Amiris. Yes, he is. 
And we have the Nurgle of Zephyrus here. Looks like he's been cleaning up these bombers now. Um, you know, being able to just spool on a bomber while the rest of his team do their work elsewhere. Although it looks like they have actually been having a coordinated effort to put their uh, damage on the same targets to just, you know, clean this up, make a smooth uh, transition to make sure they're not going to lose that EOS in these last few moments of the game. I suspect the EOS might actually go down after the Lashak stops moving and lets his gun just shoot. But at the, at the moment, like... Those bombers, I don't think they were a right call for this comp at all. They're just, they've got no way to su support them at all. They just lost them. Meanwhile, Especially the Nurgle and going... had a fun time. I mean, looking at the, where the drones are now, I mean, that would be a perfect time to play a bomb. Although, um, in defense of uh, Ramrod there, uh, it was a bit of a mess all with uh, drones and people being all over the show. So there wasn't exactly a clear target for a bomb run. But like you say, this bomber is probably a bit of a waste, especially at the meaning that they had to rely on that Pontifex to do the tackle of them. So you're committing your only form of links and one of, you know, a rather squishy ship to be your frontline tackle while running Frig Lodgy. The shack not shooting. There we, we go. Gonna... Change targets? Why does he change targets to a swivel? You had the EOS. Oh, okay. Looks like Don't he is going that. for a swivel. It's either that or we're seeing another classic visual bug happening here. Um, oh, he's hey, actually ooh. shooting it. Nope. Okay. He's actually getting it. <laughs> no, my actually oh, got hey. a kill. Never mind. I was wrong. Okay, so he's gonna make sure it's not a white, uh, whitewash uh, last layer on the ramrod side. Actually, he's taking someone down with him. Um, he's <laughs> let's see if he can clean up a bunch more targets. Just uh, get a couple of kill marks on his ship before he's come removed from the game. Yeah, whenever these small ships get nearby the Balgon, the Balgon immediately web them, and the Lashak can kill them. But I was surprised by him going off of the year, so he's now just left them. Like, okay, cool, thanks for removing the webs. I'm just going to leave now, sir. So we'll see if they're able to clean up anything else, but um, hopefully everyone's learned their lesson here from seeing that Swiftle disappearing to just uh, don't get complacent, don't try and play games with these two battleships on the field right now. Um, I'm, I'm wondering now if uh, investing in this top-end heavy style of these two battleships, especially these really, really expensive battleships, um, you know, force them to, to go the bombers. You know, maybe the bombers isn't something that they wanted to do, it's just something they had to do. Like, come on, surely you can fly anything but bombers in that scenario. I mean, even a couple of, like, tackle frigates. Anything but ships that are just going to die while providing nothing. Because you're going well, to have to wait till the shack gets on the, on, the, on the grid anyway. He has to wait till the shack gets a target. And the bombers will probably die before that matters. <laughs> so it's, I don't like I the think bombers the in this comp. May, they might they might have been a reaction to what we've seen with the attack battle cruisers being fielded because i mean uh, you know a couple of bombers in these two battleships against oracles uh, that would have been a fun thing to see but we're seeing the f full drone meta coming out here um and just you know they're, they're having their way right now with uh ramrod trying to finish up the spell and then they'll be working on the shack um in this last half of the game right now yeah, the Balgon is smart bombing off the drones as best he can, but these are Ishtar drones and Eos drones. I think Eos drones actually get a uh, a health buff, but... So it's interesting that you're saying that this Balgorn is smart bombing. He indeed is, but that means, um, you know, he's a gun bow as well. So Mullen, I, mean, I think that's like... <laughs> yeah, like, and then he has a smart bomb, and then how many newts and nostas you have? I mean, what are you trying to do with this Balgorn right now? Wouldn't you rather put the smart bombs on the Lashak? I mean, I think, I think the Lashak actually had some as well, so I'm pretty sure the Lashak also had a smart bomb or two, so they've got uh, smart bombs on both ships. And look at the Balgon going down into, into the hull now. They're trying to shoot this tower at the moment. They're not doing too poorly, but I suspect the Oniris is baiting him just a little tiny bit. <laughs> just trying to give him a bit of like a uh, bit of hope oh, there at the end, but yeah, it's, it's not you really going to be happening. Uh, we also see a couple of repair bots coming around on the Ishtar, so they're definitely going to be keeping him alive there right now, and reps fully landing. Uh, GFs are being put in local right now, so uh, at least some well mannerism here at the end, um, but they still do have to play this match to completion, so um, either they're going to have to let the Fermi Dragons kill them, the time run out, or just boundary themselves if we see the Belgorn finally go down. Yeah, we're seeing Radikos in the uh, Lashak trying to transversal match that Ishtar, but it just didn't matter. And uh, this shot is actually burning in for him. Well, I do believe the Triglavian weapon system is one of the best tracking in the game. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean you can still be lazy, like, flying missiles to drones. Um, you do still have to apply a tiny bit of brain power um, because, you know, hey, that Ishtar orbiting him now, um, he's probably still going to have a bad time hitting it now unless he doesn't have any, unless he has tackle. Yep, and you see he stopped firing now, so he's switching over ammo types or potentially switching targets. 
It looks like everyone's tithing in on this Ishtar here now at the end. The Nurgle, the, the Ulda Ishtars, everyone wants a lost piece of this Ishtar. Ah, this uh, Lashak here oh, yeah. at the and end. One thing I forgot to mention earlier, these are actually gun Ishtars. They're not new Ishtars at all, so they're all going in with their blasters to just rip this Lashak apart. Oh, that they've is very interesting that you patient. mentioned that. They've been remarkably patient in these, in these uh, blaster ships to wait until the right moment to then go in and obliterate whatever's left. So, honestly, bravo. <laughs> I would not be that patient in blaster Ishtars and Eneos. And we're going to the last minute of the game, so they should be able to finish up this the shack before the time runs out. Um, and doing a marvelous job of this. I don't think we actually saw a sentry drop there at the beginning. Do you think they did that to avoid the bombs? I think they just didn't bother. Like, yeah. I was like, nah, we don't need sentries. We're all good. And we see a quite a convincing victory here by uh, Frame Dragons. Um, with that, we're actually going to be taking a break before we head over to our next game. Um, so we'll see you back in the studio after the break. That's what I'm talking about, guys. We've made a great effort so far. Let's just keep it up. That's right! We can't have anyone freak out out there, okay? We've got to keep our composure! We've come too far! There's too much to lose! We've got to just keep our composure! <laughs>
15 seconds to make a cool AT ad. It's got to have dank content. Overused MLG man. <laughs> and MLG Daniel wait. No profanity. How am I supposed to make an AT ad without saying fun? What is the best Indian wormhole corp? That's Biotech LD. Ah, you're teasing me, naughty naughty. Bold is actually not an Indian corporation. Bold is actually not a wormhole corporation. Bold is recruiting. No ego PVP. Introducing Grath Telkin, your personal assistant from Pandemic Legion. Hey Grath, I'm 15 jumps out. Can I still get in on the fleet? How the f*** are you 15 jumps away? Why would you be 15 jumps away from where the f*** we are? Undone. A day, sir. I'll have a... Bar guest. How original. And with extra paladin. Daring today, aren't we? We've all had trouble. Multi-spectrums not as hard as they used to be. The little blue pill, so you can last all fight long. Slaves, get your ass back here!
He can't do anything. This wild card Atana jammed by a single Griffin. This is the brave story right here, right now. Oh my god. Okay, listen, li I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this one time. Okay. They are only doing 1000 DPS from the. You're winning this game. Provided this f stays alive. If this guy doesn't stay alive, then suddenly you lose that race. Oh, it's not a lemon. I'm just like. It's an 800 DPS lemon. It's not. Is that the one you were shooting friendlies or? No, that's not the one I was shooting friendlies. The one you were shooting friendlies is the game we won. Should I save this? I think I should just save it. Yeah, I think you should save it. Entitled Lemon I think we're gonna save it. <clears throat> Lemon Theory. <laughs> Hi. Clearly I'm not the real Brisk Ball. But sometimes it's not so easy to know what's real and what's fake. When on Reddit, check your facts. Drink quaff. This message was paid for and sponsored by Quaff. Now introducing Quaff Glow, the incandescent beverage.
seconds to make a cool AT ad. It's got to have dank content. Overused MLG man. <laughs> and MLG Daniel wait. No profanity. How am I supposed to make an AT ad without saying fun? What is the best Indian wormhole corp? That's Biotech LD. Ah, you're teasing me, naughty naughty. Bold is actually not an Indian corporation. Bold is actually not a wormhole corporation. Bold is recruiting. No ego PVP. Introducing Grath Telkin, your personal assistant from Pandemic Legion. Hey, Grath. I'm 15 jumps out. Can I still get in on the fleet? How the f*** are you 15 jumps away? Why would you be 15 jumps away from where the f*** we are? And welcome back after that short break. Uh, before the break, we had uh, Flaming Dragons versus Ramrod shenanigans with Flaming Dragons taking the game of them. Um, unfortunately, I think we're, we're about to have some really harsh criticism come in uh, against Ramrod here. Jin Tan, what do you have to say about the game we saw there with the double bombers? I don't have much to say in terms of criticism against Ramrod and more just like, you know, absolute praise uh, for their opponents in that match. The way they were able to just pick apart each individual ship on the opponent's team, make sure that they, the opponent, uh, make sure that Ramrod couldn't really achieve that concentration of force that they needed to, to really burst down a target and start making that heavy DPS comp work. It was just really excellent. Like they were able to move the ships around in such a way that they weren't able to focus fire properly. And it was just, just like, yeah, some some teams have really good cohesion in that sense, and it's beautiful to watch. And absolute yeah. patience too. Like they had such patience to have blast the Ishtars and not just yeet themselves into the first target they could. Like they waited to the perfect moment, and you saw at the very end, like okay, nothing but a Lashak left, and just dove everyone onto the Lashak and just showed how much DPS they actually have. They played it wow. so smart and careful against a double battleship. I, I, I think this football was also kind of thinking, oh, nothing but battleships left, and then whack. <laughs> the only loss <laughs> that they actually suffered that round. Um, but uh, Howling, if you're here with us, um, what do you think about their format, uh, their sorry, setup of taking the two battleships on a top heavy with the bombers mixed in there? Well, yeah, I think it's... Um... It... Well, yeah, I mean, obviously in that case, it didn't work out right. Uh, you ended up against Ishtars. Um... Uh, which is sort of like drones on your bombers uh, was pretty rough. Uh, it it could have worked really well if the enemy team had, well, like battleship based. It would have been just tons of damage with the two bombers, the shack and the Balgorn. Um, but unfortunately, it didn't really play out that way. Um, and it was kind of like the well, maybe not the perfect counter, but it was definitely hard countered uh, with the uh, the Ishtar drones just shredding the bombers. Uh, and keeping the 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 logi frigates busy as well. I think that was also part of the problem. Was you have such low range with the logi frigates, you have to keep the bombers close, <laughs> so amplify the issues. Definitely so, uh, Jujak. Um, some people were making comments that the Belgorn and the Shack maybe should have given a bit more focus to the light tackle on Fleming's side a bit earlier, like that Nurgle and the Spitball. Do, do you agree with them or not? I feel like it would be hard to to get a hold of them if they could. Like the other team didn't present a lot of very obvious targets, but the Balgorn seemed to be boating around a bit more, like trying to get something in the webs at times where there wasn't that much to do that seemed sensible at the time. Yeah, you know, I think it's actually what Jinten said. Maybe not so much, um, you know, criticism here for Ramrod, more just, you know, um, good play on Fabian's side of being evasive and making sure, you know, things are not necessarily in the right place, just not in the wrong place. Um, I think 
we only really saw the EOS getting caught there by the Belgor, and eventually with them, you know, giving up the chase on the shack and turning it around. Uh, it was a bit funny watching them try and give that on Eros a bit of a run. Um, Jintan, do you have any comment on them actually only having a Pontifex on the Ramrod side for their tackle, for the light tackle? Yeah, it did make it really difficult for them to get those bigger guns uh, into effect, especially given the fact that, you know, the Balgorn does have the web range bonus, but it doesn't have a web strength bonus. If you only have one of those webs fitted, it's still very difficult to track uh, when you're trying to take out some of these smaller ships that are able to hold you in position and, you know, at the end of the day, lock you down. I really think that they would have done better if they would would have been able to you know, maybe coordinate a little bit, trap down one of those tackle ships, take them early on, force them to make the decision as to which of the two battleships you're going to lock down between the Lashak and the Bel uh, the Balgorn, and then move on from there. You know, make it so that at least one of your ships is going to be able to fr is going to be free to properly maneuver. Mm. And then, Wing, uh, Wingnut, um, I think we were speaking quite a bit on the target choice that these bombers were having. Um, what were they doing, and what do you think they should have done on their target choice for the torpedo? Two ish at the start. I, I, and I'm not, like, you know, occasionally I make mistakes, but I was watching torpedoes fly in and hit these Ishtars, and there's not a single out torpedo button on the field. So they were shooting an Ishtar with bombers. No! Especially not when it's not tackled. It was an Ishtar burning around freely, getting shot at by bombers. So what no. should they have done then? Ishtar. Not Ishtar, sorry. Eos. <laughs> Shoot the Eos. It's bigger. It's easier to hit, at least for the start. If you tackle something down, then sure, you can fire bombers at that if you really want to. But that, honestly, the bombers are just not the right call for that comp. Maybe the versing Bowser might have done better, but ta like that comp is not good for bombers. <laughs> So, Harley, I want to ask now, when, when we, I don't think we've seen really a battleship pair like that um, besides for the Widows, um, but when, oh, the Dominics is also featured, but when you have these uh, aggressive styled battleships um, which want to actually go in um, and not stay back like the Dommies do, is it a good idea to have them almost pair up and follow target together, or would you like to see them like split up and maybe be a bit more positional play? I think it... Um... It does depend on the on the battleships on the duo, you know, uh, and and kind of their fits. But I think in in a lot of cases, and especially in this case, they could have benefited from not necessarily splitting up and kind of pursuing their own targets, but um, using. There was a moment where they tackled the EOS down um, after they were chasing the Aneros, um, and they so then the Aneros had to come back in to get reps on the. Uh, on the EOS that was tackled, and there, there could have been um, an opportunity there for the Balgon to cap out or, or web or you know do something to the Aneros. Um, there just didn't seem to be much uh, of like a, a grasp opportunity there. So um, you know that that could have been something they could have played on, and and it, it was a very strong combo in my opinion, just not necessarily against those ships and in that scenario, but could have worked out fairly well. Mm. And um, Chujak, I wanted to ask now, uh, with Lynx, especially losing the Pontifex that early, you know, they probably got Lynx off the field, lost them. Um, how much do Lynx play a part in you deciding what uh, when you're making a comp? Like, is Lynx a priority for you? I would think that we... Like, there has to be a good reason to not run them a lot of the time, especially in this format where you're restricted on ship types. Like you're not very often going to be in a situation where you definitely don't want destroyers, nor do you want battle cruisers. We have a few linkless setups, but I would say that like 85% plus of our our comps had links in them. All also, right, no. the links, the link destroyers especially fit well into like being cheap and securing the low end of the of the comps and Halloween, i want to ask you actually uh considering we just had two bombers there with actually bomb launchers do you give uh, quite a lot of thought maybe to the potential of bombs coming in and also um do you th con uh, think about defender missiles at all at any time it's actually interesting during that match i was thinking like uh, i haven't seen a bomb run in a while uh, i i from the top of my head, I don't remember anything that was uh, like that, or that happened in the um, the Alliance Open. Um, and from the matches I've seen of this tournament, I haven't seen it either. Uh, usually, just there as as tort boats, not not bombing uh, 
it's been a long time. We we asked like as our team didn't put tons of thought into it, um, but it's it's definitely like a, something you got to consider, um, especially if you're doing like bulked up comps uh, where the, where like just having your whole team hit by a bomb wave is <laughs> is going to really mess you up, um, and especially with rep drones things like that. So uh, it's something that you definitely do have to keep into uh, keep in mind. As far as defender missiles go, I don't think we put any thought into them. It's not even something I necessarily think about <laughs> tons. I haven't really seen them put to much use, um, but could it could be something for sure. Thanks. Um, so the next game we're going to be having is going to be Jovco Mining Division versus AP Stole My Fit. Um, still a bit of time before the teams will be taking the arena, um, but Wingnut, can you go over the bands that the teams have chosen? No worries. So Jovco banned out uh, Balgorn, Curse, Gila, and since they had a, a shared band, they banned out Rattlesnake. Then AP Stole My Fit burned out Curse, Paladin, Scimitar, Etana. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Curse band makes perfect sense. I like that both sides are like, no, we don't want to see that. We don't want that. But Paladin band? What? Mm, Jintan, thoughts on that? You know, your guess is as good as mine there. Um, I mean, we've seen them before, but I mean, isn't Bastion banned in this in this format? Bastion has pretty much always been banned, so they normally only take them for the bonuses that the hull would give, not the modules. Good lord. So we're talking about basically a, a capacitor bonus apocalypse that doesn't quite have the same tracking bonus, but has a bit of an active rep bonus. I don't know, what, what, what composition really hates that? Before you well, kill think... any highs, certainly. Yeah, like you can take exactly a lot that. of smart bombs and nudes. So that's generally why the Marauders have um, been taken, um, especially the Paladin. The Paladin, you could see almost more of a tracking style setup, um, more back, um, and they'd uh, do that. And they'd have their highs to kind of also make a neutralization dead zone around them or have the smart bombs. So um, that's their journey, what they'd capitalize on as well. Um, I don't know. Uh, they haven't been featured that much because of their points cost, but it is interesting there. Uh, Judak, have you guys played around with the uh, Marauders at all? We flew against them several times in practice and decided that we would not put them in any of our own comps. Uh, I want to well, say that someone in chat actually here has had an amazing point, which is Kalafi, who mentioned that it's for um, shield kite comps, and that makes perfect sense because the Paladin has uh, massive resistances against kinetic damage, which means that they're going to be naturally more resistant to the rapid lights or the kinetic bonus Kaldari ships. Some good points uh, that have been raised there. Um, so we'll see actually if it does come into play, although you know it has been removed here. Um, but so with the uh, rattlesnake howling, um, is that a big threat you guys have been seeing or is this another case that we're seeing with the curse of um, it's just mostly being banned and not actually being fielded? Uh, I think uh, it's definitely there's a reason why it's being banned. When we were uh, scrimming uh, during practices, Rattlesnakes, the, the DPS output from a Rattlesnake is crazy with Tech 2 drones. Um, and definitely if you if you don't get do an effective job of, of like uh, screening that DPS, like uh, getting the drones off you, you, you know, you'll just get shredded. Uh, whether it's worth banning in every single match, uh, I mean, it doesn't seem to be qu quite as banned out as the curse, but... There's there's definitely ways of sort of handling it, but yeah, it's DPS output does make it quite spooky. And also going back now to what they were mentioning in chat about the kiting comps, um, because of, you know the potential while we've seen the scimitar band here and with AP Storm my fit. Well, yeah, just um, well, once say like bang the paladin to take a kite comp and then bang the scimitar to stop kite comps. Um, Dujak, do you think uh, Etana can actually be part of a Kadi comp, even though it's banned here? Yeah, certainly it's um, it, it's it can take care of itself if it's screened for. If you are actually warping in a fifty and burning away from people, Etana is. I, I like it more than uh, a basilisk, certainly, but I don't think that you'd necessarily have to have one in order to make a kiting comp work. So, wing that, um, I want to ask now, we've seen a couple of interdictors, heretics, flycatchers. Um, do you think teams 
why would they not have been using the wobble, the new status verification bubble? That's allowed? Yeah, it's, we have allowed it. No idea. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, I mean, Jitan, do you have any I comments on that? I suppose it probably hurts them more than anyone else, to be honest. Cause you, Dude, I, I, I love the wobble. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, it's allowed. Why are you not bringing that every chance you get? <laughs> well, even if it's, not, even if it's not good, you want to use it because it's fun. Like, let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> I think the one thing is, um, before they updated it, it, it was technically possible to drop it and just heat your prop in with links and run before it popped um, and affected the interdictor. But with new changes they made of it, um, an interdictor will always get caught in their own wobble, which can spell your own doom. Um, we do also have the teams being teleported into the system right now. They have not taken the arena yet. Um, so we will update you as soon as that happens. But um, for the Wobble side of things, I mean, I have seen it in my scrims um, before. People have used the interesting, uh, sort of interesting tactic where they actually made a bit of a quote-unquote sacrificial play with a dictator right on the zero to stop a rush comp, uh, which was interesting. Um, definitely had a control, but teams just haven't seemed to be making use of that at all. So... These comps, is people, people aren't willing to sacrifice that one in seven guy. You don't want to sacrifice mm. that one ship just to do this one job. That honestly hurts him more than it will hurt anybody else. It's like, do I really want to give up my ability to like delete a deacon from max from max range and have like a flycatcher or a, a heretic just to have this like a small a bubble of web in the middle? Do I really care that much? One thing I'm wondering, um, going back maybe to the previous game, Gen Ten, um, do you think? Uh, Ramrod was expecting a certain type of setup with that uh, comp they took, and just the EOS um, drone setup was just a bad matchup for them? Uh, that would be my expectation, yeah, because that seems like such a, a setup that's designed to take on something like that double apocalypse, double org navy setup that we saw previously from Spectre Fleet. Something where you're going to be able to use those purifiers to just burn massive amounts of the HP before they die, purely just due to lock timers or other major, you know, kind of just class disadvantages that you end up facing when you bring that kind of a setup. Hmm. That'd be my uh, expectation, at least. I kind of agree with you on that one because um, I feel you know with the, we've been with the increased show of the attack battle cruisers coming, um, that's maybe something they were hoping for that either some nagas or oracles were going to show up and they would just be able to slap them in the face with that damage. Um, we do have teams slowly taking the arena though. Um, Hoping no technical difficulties will come here. So we'll soon be having Jalco Mine Division versus AP Stole My Fit. Um, and then we'll be having going to the arena now with Jintan and Jujek. That timing. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Anger Games Arena. I'm Yin Tan, joined here by Dujek, and we're about to watch the red team of Jovko Mining go up against AP Stole My Fit, and we have a very interesting matchup here, one I haven't seen for a decent while in the tournament settings, because we have a Mimitar Rush team here, ladies and gentlemen, from, a jo from the Jovko Mining division. With double jackdaw, double slepnir, vagabond, scalpel, scalpel. What are they going up against, do Jack? They're going up against double raven, double oracle, double og navy, and a nurgle, and they have warped in at zero. Yeah, this is really interesting because we have the uh, the actual Mimitar team seems to have walked in at max range as well. So there's every chance that they could be not a rush team, but an artillery team. I haven't had a chance to check the guns yet. we got 30 seconds there before the match. Let's see if I can check it in fast enough and remember what the models look like. This certainly is Bizarro World to me. I would never have imagined seeing the, the Ravens at zero and the Slepnurse at 50. That just... It doesn't but... seem right, but it does look like those are artillery fit to the slap those, but who knows? We'll see. Those jackdaws, too, will be good at range. They're always going to be, so they have a huge advantage here, but there's only a couple of targets from the shoot through. That, nor that uh, Nurgle, really, is what we're going to see most of that damage be applied to. 
Yeah, it's interesting that um, you have the large Gila setup. I've at least uh, split off from the tradition today of uh, all lasers and uh, shooting all lasers into slip nerves. It's never going to be a great idea. So having the Ravens uh, hit kinetic uh, really makes it much harder to tank as that slip nerve goes down. Wow, that was unbelievably quick there. Did it not? <laughs> did it not boost? Did it DC? That's such terrible luck if it DC. That's unfortunately the play of the game, but uh, it is what it is. There's the organ navy issue though. If Huan is still taking a lot of damage in half armor now. Well, our um, experience was that Ravens match up very well against Slepners. They shoot slowly, so like the Slepner has a very low buffer as it's normally fit and the ravens shoot slow but high alpha volleys of kinetic damage oh the them. scalpel they're going into armor so quickly something seems to have gotten a hold of it i can't tell what oh it looks like uh yeah it looks like some of the no, it looks like that she's just not got enough transversal there dipping into hull it's just managed to survive insane slept going down as well huan's dying as well but it's not and not even close to enough here Yeah, this is going to be uh, difficult to uh, claw back for Jovko, who have uh, an attack bar that is uh, small, to say the least. Like, the Jackdaws might get down a Nurgle, but other than that, they do not have the damage to kill a Raven for the remainder of this match. It seems like the Fly Killer itself has been swatted here by this Logulus team. Those two oracles just putting out so much damage that even with the enhanced EM thermal resistance of the T2 Mimitar, just melted in the face of it, along with that Raven as well. well definitely there going down. We'll definitely need to give oracles a medal for today. They've been pretty uh, dangerous when they're dangerous, and... Uh... Yeah, they. Yeah, they it really is surprising. So We're seeing a lot of, sh seeing a lot of unusual uh, ships that I'm not used to seeing do this well, do exceptionally well. The Oracle, the Raven, the Nurgle, killing you know absolute classics here in the Jackdaw, the Sletner, the Scalpel. These are all ships that we normally see at the very very final stages of the tournament, ruling the day, and here they are getting wiped off the face by this absolutely amazing comp by AP Stone by Fit. I'm interested to see if we see some more of this going forward in the tournament. I just want to know how much total DPS this uh, Raven Oracle team can put out. Like the attack bars are, <laughs> their attack bar is as large as their defense bar, larger in fact right now. It's just so much damage. Yeah, we'll get to mm -hmm. see, we see ben, and transversal. <laughs> ben Nakano just trying his best to live for as long as he can. You can see there a couple of getting tickled a little bit by the uh, radio from the oracles. Perhaps he should uh, look for a boundary in order to get a boundary uh, medal. Do you think uh, replaying this in your head? Is there any way that the uh, fly killer team could have won uh, could have done this better? Could have applied? that kind of immediate alpha that they bring to the table in a way that was disruptive to a piece on my fit here. I feel like the entire, the base concept of fly killer is we kill your linchpin ship and it gives us an edge. We kill your lodge, we kill your tackle, we get away. If there's no linchpin ship that holds the other team together, like what are you gaining from it? It's not, you're trading the raw power of having battleships hammer across their DPS for precision. But if that precision has to go into a DPS ship that is heavily tanked anyway, like where is the benefit? Yeah, for sure. And there we are, though, with AP Storm I Fit comfortably taking the victory. We will hand everything back over to the studio. Hi. 
Clearly, I'm not the real Brisk Ball. But sometimes it's not so easy to know what's real and what's fake. When on Reddit, check your facts. Drink quaff. This message was paid for and sponsored by Quaff. Now introducing Quaff Glow, the incandescent beverage. Welcome back. We just saw the match there between Javko Mani and AP Storm at Fit. Uh, with AP winning there, um, just to point out there, we had the Ravens were, which were using torpedoes and the Slepners were actually running um, auto cannons as well. Um, so, Wingnut, can you maybe comment a bit on what happened there for that game with the warp ins, actually? Well, the Ravens warped at zero, but the Slepners warped at 50? I feel like I was in like La La Land there where everything's like backwards. But it looks like one of the Slepnirs either was either AFK or DC or something because at the start of the match that first Slepnir did not move, did not boost, did not command burst, did literally nothing and died. So something must have happened there, unfortunately, which is a bit of a shame because I wanted to see how that would have gone. But I kind of think the Ravens would have still had it, to be honest. There's a lot of DPS to try and tank. And we have had a confirmation as well, just by CCP and by people in chat and local, that there was no abs absolutely no disconnect that happened there. So I'm um, not too sure what happened on the pilot side of things, but it is quite unfortunate. Um, Jinten, what's your choice on those warp ins? Because I did find it interesting that the AC slips decide to come in at range. Yeah, I can understand that because it's a good caution option. Like if you're worried about jumping on top of maybe double Hyperion or something like that, where... You know, if they even land a web on you, you're in real big trouble and you've got to control your approach really carefully. But in that situation, you still get a lot out of, you know, warping in at 30 unless they also choose to warp in at 30 and they land at a similar angle to you. You know, it. I understand it, but it seems like a bit of a cowardly move. If you're going to bring some AC slips, you know, commit to it. Really uh, go at it with some chutzpah. Yeah, warping yeah, at least like... at 30. 50 is a little excessive. I mean, if you're warping at 50 and they've got something like a laser comp at extra 50 of their own, you're now going to burn 100k before you can do anything? Warping at, like, way closer than 50, please. That is... I uh, also, like, when you guys called it, there was a Minotaur Rush, and, like, with Minotaur Rush at that range? That's exceptionally weird. Um, Harleen, do you think they would have had a reason for actually warping at the range, like Jinten said as well? Yeah, I kind of agree. It's just it's it's cautionary. You don't want to be at zero and the other team brings uh, Vindy or something. Uh, you're gonna get webbed immediately and and have a real bad time. But the uh, 50 kilometers is yeah, I agree. Is is a bit too far because like say if you got to go in on something, you've got to start brawling it. It's a long way to travel. 50 kilometers minimum, you know. Uh, it's just a bit too much. So I would have I would have said like uh, 30 if you want to be safe. But I mean, I think for the in this circumstance. Uh, Zero would have been fantastic. Just get right on the, the DPS quickly and just pray you don't die. <laughs> That's definitely it. Um, and uh, Dujak, um, it's something you mentioned during the match with the Ravens um, and actually the, the damage types. Now, while Ravens aren't actually bonus towards a certain uh, damage type, the Kinetic more coming in for the T2 Kaldari, um, is that... Uh, a so I said advantage of being able to choose your missile type and damage type a really big advantage of the Raven? Yeah, it definitely is, especially in um, in this day and age of the resist nerfs, but um, reactives being so powerful, like it didn't matter here, obviously. But if you um, looked at uh, some of the previous tournaments, like uh, Nighthawks being kinetic locked matters if everything you have has to be kinetic locked, whereas the Raven shooting uh, kinetic into those uh, Slepners is going to be very good for damage especially if the all dps team is assuming that they might go up against minimatar having all lasers is going to cut your damage by 90 percent so you don't want to shoot only lasers into uh into a slepner you might never kill it and then bouncing off of that, Howling, um, do you give a lot of thought when you see an armor comp and there's this potential of almost an assurity of their reactives? How how do you handle reactive partners? Yeah, we do uh, we do put some thought into that for sure. Uh, with with regards to ships, especially like we were um, 
uh, running like a lot of ham comps and stuff like that. Uh, you starting with different ammo uh, ammo types can really help in that regard. You just basically nullify the reactive uh, by you know shooting all kinds of resists at it. Uh, it, it's definitely something you have to consider if you want to punch through things like that. Because once this, you know, once they're all on your one resist, it's really hard to break. Mm. Um, and obviously, there is always the shifting time taken into account as well. I mean, if if you if it's something just disappears fast enough, it never uh, really matters. <laughs> well, that is shifting the whole time. Um, Wingnut, do you think they could have done anything differently in with those slips to actually win the match then? I mean, besides the first guy actually being there, yeah, <laughs> open, at th open at 30 and just try your best to brawl or take down maybe an Oracle. But it's you're going to be chasing an Oracle while being shot up by Ravens. It might have been better just to go in on the Raven. It's kind of hard to you know, call wh who's where at the time, you know? But mm. essentially, don't warp at 50 because by the time they would have gotten to the fight anyway, they already would eaten like three or four volleys and probably cycled at least twice in the next LASPs. I would definitely have loved to see some of those Raven fits. There's so many aspects that I'm wondering about. And somebody mentioned they were Torp fit. Yes. Yes. Takes a bit of mods to get that kind of a range with a Raven. Like, I am curious uh, as to... As well, to how, like, if the, if the Slepnips went straight back, like, how far do they need to go before they're out of range? Wondering if I can find a fit here, but um, you know, the, they did get well, the Raven, not necessarily itself, but uh, torpedoes in general did get a bit of a range increase um, in the, the couple of patches ago, so that did help them uh, definitely a lot. And you know, with uh, we do actually even allow pirate ammo in this tournament format, so um, faction and pirate ammo has um, generally better range uh, than the close T2 ammo while still providing a rather decent damage and also having a better explosion radius and so on. Um, whereas the T2 torps would be better suited to you know, shooting those slow, heavy, big targets. Um, the faction ammo is generally norm normally what people would use for these smaller or targets that are further away. Gen 10, I do want to ask you, um, do you think the Ravens were actually crucial for, crucial for this victory or could any battleship have been there? Uh, I don't really know in this case. In this case, they were Torps, which are, you know, they are the highest raw DPS output system that you can pick, but they then have some application issues, so in practice, they tend to not be. Uh, but in this case, it did help them, you know, push through a ton of damage where they need when they needed it. So maybe this particular match, yes, but overall to the comp, I think it is kind of interchangeable. It's, uh, it's just one of those things where you pick pick based on what you expect the opponents to bring in this case they picked absolutely 100 percent correctly and then for the next game we're going to be having we form volta with uh versus faming dragons um so jinten again can you go over the bands that they've chosen for this game oh give me a moment no I'm just fine. gonna bring up our wonderful spreadsheet thank you uh so yeah so we have we, we form volta banning the curse nighthawk and healer whilst Flaming Dwagons uh, have banned Blackbird, Widow, and Vindicator. And interesting for me is that this Vindy has been appearing in the bands now. Um, we've seen people more doing the other pirate battleships of the Belgor and the Rattlesnake, and then going for a T1 battleship of Dominix or Hyperion. Um, Wingnut, do you think there's a reason the Vindy has started to creep into the bands now? Essentially, it's a battleship that can self-screen at close range like it's, it's a bra brawling hyperion that if you try and tackle it has a very good chance of just killing you itself without even trying so it's like you don't want to try and throw your tackle at it and it also obviously puts out a metric ass ton of dps so it's like we don't really want to verse that a hyperion yeah sure maybe a dominix yeah maybe um, even a megaton yeah sure but a vindicator I i'll pass chief i, I don't want to tackle that I won't do anything else. <laughs> yeah, it's generally really scary because um, most battleships will have grapples and grapples have that kind of... You can play a bit of the range of a grapple at least, um, but just having those 14 kilometers, 90% uh, webs is definitely a scary thing for tackle. Uh, Dujek, I want to ask you, with the Nighthawk uh, here seen in the bands, um, we, we saw an Alliance Opens a varied approach to the weapon systems that the Nighthawks have been taking. Um, why would teams be choosing either weapon systems for the Nighthawk? Well, hams have a very short range. If you um, 
run um, Fury missiles on a ham, you're getting 17 kilometers. If you run up against somebody who has tracking disruption and is planned for that, they can basically keep you only able to damage what you what they want you to damage. Whereas anything else, well, I mean, heavy missiles lose 50% of the DPS in order to apply to anything that they want, range-wise, anyway. All right. Um, and then, Holly, you know, it's also, do you guys, when you have a missiles, um, how much thought do you actually give to application of the missiles? I think it's something you, you have to, you know, you have to give a lot of thought to and, and, and make sure that the, the stuff you're bringing can fully apply. If you're if your comp can really only apply to like you know battleships and up you're you're handicapping yourself if uh you know if, if you come across a, a cruiser based comp uh your half your dps is already nullified just by the ships you're shooting at um you need to kind of balance in with those high dps am ships uh uh you know tps and webs and things like that and and they need to be on ships that are going to stay alive crucially mm -hmm. and it is Normally, application comes up when we're talking mostly about missiles. Um, but it, in general, is it something you get thought to even when you're running a pure turret comp? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's basically the same idea, and 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 also maybe not so much in these seven v sevens, but definitely in uh, when you have more manpower, like the ten v tens, uh, you can start doing more things with like uh, remote tracking computers and and getting more inventive with the comps. I mean, you could pro you could do them in the seven v sevens, but. Uh, you know, they they definitely get more more use uh, when you have more more people on grid to and the more mids to use them on. Um, but that's a, a great way of 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 getting up with some extra application. And Jintan, we've been seeing the Gila show up a lot here in the bands. Um, first off, how do you pronounce Gila, and why would people be banning it? I pronounce it Gila in accordance with the Gila monster, which it is named after. Uh, and you would ban the Gila for a lot of reasons, but the primary one is that we can use T2 drones here, and T2 drones are incredibly powerful and incredibly hard to kill, especially when you combine them with the HP bonus that all of the Garistas ships get. But the healer in particular is just really, really powerful for the category that's in. It's why it's so, so much more expensive on Tranquility than any of the other pirate cruisers, because it's so useful in a variety of circumstances. Mm. I can't remember um, if this is true, but I'm pretty sure for all the Gila drones combined, if you tried to defang them, would actually have more EHP than the Gila itself, I think. That, that's certainly that something mean. people say. It's like, oh, you can just defang them, but you know, you have to commit so much time to them, and then they just launch some more. Uh, but we do have teams arriving into the arena now, so we will be handing it off to Wingnut and Howling to take the commentating for this game. Alrighty there, guys. Welcome to the next match, match uh, number fifty of the uh, Hunger Games. We've got We Form Bolter versus Farming Dragons. Uh, would you like to talk us through what ships they brought today? Sure. Well, uh, Volta has shown up with looks like uh, Mimitar Rush. I'm trying to check the guns, um, but uh, uh, double Slepner, double Stabber, uh, Tana, double Sweeper was nasty comp. Yeah, it looks like they've got auto cannons on those Slepners, so I suspect they'll be the same for the Stabbers. Yes, indeed, that's full auto cannon rush. Meanwhile, on the other side, we have the Eos, Double Ishtar, um, Oniros, Nurgle, Sifu Heretic comp again. Very strong comp, but I'm hoping this absolute rush can just rip through a few of these targets quickly. I'm curious to see what they're going to pick. Which target is your first uh, port of call? I think... Uh... I think I would go for something uh, something light, uh, maybe this people or... or uh... Maybe, well, I mean, the Nova can uh, can probably tank it, but just try and volley it right off the uh, off the bat, and then maybe uh, play it from there. See what see what they can work on. Interesting, of course, is like the weak, really the weakest uh, ships on that comp is really just the Stabbers, because the Spitballs obviously have their mode switch; they can you know, pick to be faster or more tanky, whereas the Stabbers just have that lovely and large frigate set of uh, of uh, layer. Yeah, I guess they're running them like uh, old school vagabonds, just uh, just shield extenders and just gonna, gonna have to tank it out. I think pretty much we're gonna Atana there, so if you want tank, you've got the best option there, but yeah, it's still that. a stabber, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> it can work magic, but I don't know about that much. 
And you can see them obviously charging in. The other team is pulling back, trying to build some distance. This like uh, control freak is uh, getting primaried from the bottom side. Yep, I saw. Uh, I think it was yeah, Zebediah Crane had burned straight through the enemy team. In fact, he's actually within the enemy team right now. He's gone to the other side. He's going for what looks to be the Oneros. Yep. And we can see the stab and they're just in large frigates. He will catch him. Yeah, it looks like uh, Flaming Dragons are doing the same with uh, Sveeple going for the Atana from Volta. Yep, well, the Stabber has scrammed and tackled this nearest down. Now, now, where's his DPS buddies? Are they all coming in? Oh, yeah, they're all on their way in. It's time to party. Yeah, I think that's going to be a rough time tanking that much on him. Yeah, and surely if you're playing in the, um, the Farming Dragon team, you've got to try and go for the Logi trade here or pick up some DPS ships ASAP. Yeah, I think I think the Logi is the way to go, but uh, it's going to be difficult because of the Atana's tank. Oh yeah, <laughs> the Atana is definitely the right call here. It's just such a tanky boat. It's going to survive long enough as this Nearest can't. He's trying his best, but it just doesn't matter. Gone! No, rough time with Newt's off Eos as well. Probably did not do much towards the end there. Oh yeah, now which target they're going for next? I see an Ishtar getting beaten up. I'm seeing an Eos. Oh yeah, the Eos is right in the middle next to where that the Nearest went down. You are in the wrong part of town, my friend. Yeah, that's a bad spot. It's, uh, well, I mean, he has to be there, obviously, but not a place you really want to be with no logy anymore. Yeah, it's like, oh, well, the Aeneas is down and we're all here. We might as well welcome you to the neighborhood. And yeah, he's already in Hull. There's nothing he can do. Just getting ripped apart by this Mimitar rush. It's good to see Stabbers out on the, on the field doing this. Oh, it looks like it's uh, about to go down, though, which would leave them logiless. Maybe they can uh, start clearing off some of these other ships once the Aeneas is down. I mean, you can definitely pick up the stabbers, but I feel like going after double Slepnir is going to be a tall ask for two Ishtars, as one Ishtar is already going through the last of his armor, going straight to Hull. Should mention as well, these are are those auto cannon? Yeah, auto cannon Ishtars. Okay. Unless I'm crazy, I mean, rotating barrels got to be auto cannons, right? That's a pretty interesting fit. I guess uh, <laughs> don't have to worry about cap. I like, <laughs> not sure what the yeah. the running ACs on Ishtar is, but hey. I'm mildly confused. Oh, See that other artilleries? <laughs> it, they're definitely projectiles. Oh, doesn't matter because when it's charged down, the other one's going down. So whatever his mid slots, sorry, his guns have slots are fitted with, it doesn't matter. He's going to be dead soon. Yeah, this looks like uh, it's going to be in Volta's favor. The two ships on on the flaming dragon side are uh, both half health now. Oh yeah, it looks like they're trying to go after the Swipple. I'm not sure I agree with that call, but I guess the stab is too far away for it to really matter. Maybe just clearing off tackle, try and get some more distance, but uh, I... it's going to die before it can even clear. So I'm just doing like mental mass. I, I don't know if the stabber is faster or slower than the Swipple. It's been a while. That thing took a few nerfs. But yeah, that last Ishtar has gone. Now the Heretic is dying. There's there's nothing left for this team now. They're just gonna get pulled apart by ships designed solely to murder them. It looks like TikTok's actually pulled range now, so he might even just survive to the end of the game. Yep, he is. Yeah, there's good fights in local as well. They they know it's it's done. This this Nurgle can try, but there's nothing he's gonna do. That was some uh, crazy damage from these Mimitar rush comps. Oh yeah, it's beautiful to see. I love seeing Mimitar Rush, and Mimitar Rush with an Atana is such an interesting mix, but we'll hear from the uh, studio and see what they think of this one. Oh okay, Sleep. listen, li I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this one time, okay? They are only doing 1000 DPS from the... You're winning this game. Provided this f stays alive. If this guy doesn't stay alive, then suddenly you lose that race. But it's not a lemon, I'm just like... Hey, it's an 800 DPS lemon. It's not that the one you were shooting friendlies, or...? No, that's not the one I was shooting friendlies. The one you were shooting friendlies is the game we won. Should I save this? I think I should just save it. Yeah, I think you should save it. Entitled Lemon, <clears throat> Lemon Theory. <laughs> Hey, 
And welcome back after we just saw that uh, rather convincing victory f uh, from We Form Volta. Um, it's amazing what can happen if you actually click approach when you're running an AC uh, Minotaur Rush team. Uh, Jintan, do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, it seems that Flaming Dwagons burnt out uh, as they were facing that drone composition. They just weren't able to really do enough to deal with things. Obviously, that Mimitar Rush composition does have a bit of an advantage compared to what we normally see in the Alliance tournament, given that they brought an Atana, and you aren't really going to do that, given how much an Atana costs in the Alliance tournament. But, man, you know, that was a really classic execution there from Volta. Just go after the key ships, take them off the grid, take the boosts off the grid early, make sure that you can chew through them as efficiently as possible. Great stuff from them. Mm. Um, do Jack, I wanted to ask, like, do, do you think an Atana was worth in there, or maybe a Scimitar would have sufficed? I think, why not take an Atana when you can? I think that the Scimitar probably would have been just fine there. There's nothing inherently wrong about running it. On the other hand, I'd like to speak about flying an Oneros and a drone comp, because you're normally being kept alive by your large drone friends, and that team can't run that. You can't suddenly take all your sentries and all your heavy drones, abandon them and drop heavy maintenance bots, because then you have no damage. Mm, that's a good point you raised. I think we've also kind of um, seen that before with you know, drones being issued some comps when they do the single logi instead of frig logi. Um, Harling, I think going on to that, it's something I wanted to speak about before when we've seen the Rediva being shown. Uh, normally, um, especially when we saw the Octodads, um, these T1 logis have relied on you know their rep drones and so, but why would someone be using a Rediva instead of the other T1 logis? Uh, the reason you'd want to use a Rediva is because eventually you can create a bigger EHP a second than the other T1 logistics, but you do sacrifice a lot for that opportunity. Mm. But uh, I think there's some good points raised there about running the Logi over here um, with the drone comp still. Um, you know, normally people would like to have the free Logis there. Partners can keep themselves up. Um, Wingnut. When people have been taking the Frig Lodges, what have they been preferring, and is there a reason for it? I mean, this Deacon is the set for Frigate Lodgy. We've seen a few scalpels, but honestly, I don't, don't see that many shield Frigate Lodges. It's generally just Deacons or Go Home. Hmm. Um, Howling, I want to ask then, on that, uh, is there a reason that the Frig Lodges have been more predominant on the armor side? Do you think it's the Tana taking over the slots there for the shield? Yeah, I think in this in this seven v seven setup, um, I think a lot a lot of the comps have te like trend towards the uh, the Atana or running a Simi or something. But uh, I don't think there's anything necessarily inherently terrible about running the shield um, uh, free logy like uh, Kieran scalpels. That they're, they're strong in their own right. They're just uh, I guess they're getting overlooked maybe a little bit this time. Um, you know, along with 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 the lower the lower amount of people in a team, Frigology taking up two of those slots. Yeah, you know, you have to play to your strengths, and if you're losing two of your guys to Frig uh, Logi, you know, maybe you want to run high DPS, which trends to be like uh, armor comps. Mm. Um, and then um, I just kind of was blanking out, but another question, just a bit unrelated here. Um, Jujak, how has this um? The rule that we have for offensive scripts, so scripts in like remote sensor damters, guidance disruptors, and tracking disruptors, has that affected your choice on what E-War you normally take? Oh, definitely, but that is an older change. I mean, back mm. when damp scripts were allowed, like damps were the king of E-War, not being able to lock past uh, 20, 30, 40 kilometers, depending on your ship, was horrific. You definitely see that with um, disruptions as well, but they're they still have their place and they're kind of a nice catch-all if you have the mid slots for it. But damps are almost never used anymore. Mm. But then Wingnut, why do we see people preferring the curse then with its tracking and guidance disruptors still? Because it also brings a bunch a bunch of newts as well, so it can newt things out. It can ruin every single ship except for drones to some degree from being able to do any damage. It's just so debilitating to verse. It can turn off your logi, it can turn off your DPS, 
it can noodle off your tackle and then leave it to be caught. It's just like with the right hands, it is just like I said, debilitating to a team. So, so Jintan, like in the, when we're talking about the E World lane, is it the case that it's just um, the guidance and tracking disruptors are needed, or is it just that the curse is offering so much then? Uh, the curse obviously offers so much more disruption in the form of the newts, and also it has a really big drone bay. And we've seen how effective the um, rep drones and the other utility drones can be from that kind of a platform um, in the form of the Ishtar. It just offers so much potential to take whatever your opponent is doing and say, no, you don't get to do that. The teams are taking it out because they're worried about what it might do to their game plan if someone gets in the right position with one, and I don't blame them for that. Mm, and that's, I think, when we saw earlier today, the Celeste showing up is, um, it it was it's an e platform, but that's all it could contribute to the game. And without the scripts and without having anything else, it, it just you know was left a bit. Um, lackluster layer you know whereas like it's something like the curse once again you know even if the you got a wrong choice on the guidance tracking disruptors it's still so much more to offer um so for the next game we're going to be having aggressively mid-tier versus waffles um wingnut can you go through the bands that they've chosen for this yeah waffles band uh, a reasonably normal set we've got a curse band blackbird band and a tana band that's a good little spread there aggressively mid-tier Paladin ban again. We, we've talked about that, but they've also banned Oracle, then Hyperion. That is like a mm. wide selection of bands two laser boats and then one brawling ship. And they, that leaves the Vindicator out there instead of the Hyperion. I'm, yeah, interesting set of bands. I'm not quite sure where they're going. Interesting there. I'm kind of wondering if they were aiming for some ECM kind of setup and the Blackbird got banned there. Obviously, Waffles would not have known this when they submitted their Blackbird ban, but um, Howling, do you have any thoughts on these bans for us? Uh, yeah, I think they're, they're, they're just trying to ban out like um, the kind of the classic comps again. I, I think uh, uh, there's been like a trend with all the bans today, you know, the usual bans. Um, I guess uh, Aggressively Mid tier just really doesn't want to see long range, uh, like laser DPS, ban the Paladin, ban the Oracle. They, you know, don't want to be hit from like eighty kilometers away. Um, but then they ban the Hyperion, so uh, they also don't want to be have a have a massive tank battleship right in their face. So uh, yeah, I'm not sure, not sure exactly what what they're kind of planning on, but good general bans all around anyway. Mm, definitely. So I mean, uh, Jujak, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, both the Hyperion and Paladin have rep bonuses and can be made to tank a lot. In in our testing, the Hyperion bans from us, and we have banned it more than once, was particularly because they're nasty for certain rush comps to deal with, especially um, like uh, Minimitar Rush doesn't love the Hyperion because it lives just a tiny bit too long. And the Paladin could be in a similar vein, but I'm a little bit uncertain what they're going for here. The Paladin obviously being much more expensive in points. They might have some particular comps that they've lost to in training with the comp that they want to bring today. Now, with the Paladin specifically, even though it's banned in this game, I believe in the um, Alliance Opens and then in Alliance Tournaments before, so the tournament scene in general, it showed up um, before. Um, so Jintan, why would people were using, I'm not sure if you actually know this previously before, and what was it, what did they have supporting it? Sorry, what, what ship are you talking about the support the, for, sorry? The Paladin specifically. Yeah, we've seen a couple of different things supporting them. Um, like one of the biggest things that we've seen is the Pontifex, actually, because it, you struggle to bring any other boosting ship in with the points that get taken up by the Paladin. So, you know, those are the kind of things that you typically see alongside it, either that or the Magus, to give it enough tankiness to be able to survive and live to put out the DPS that it has. So also normally with these turret ships that we've seen to help them support, especially the ones which like to sit back and track, is things like the Rapier and the Hyena or the Hugen as well. Um, but you no, know, once again, you run into that trap of uh, you spent all your points on these Paladins, you don't have these points for these expensive recons. Um, actually speaking about this, um, or we do have the teams teleporting in so long, uh, 
Wingnut, um, I don't think we've seen too much on the webification long range stuff, have we? How many rapier, Hugin, or hyena bands? And honestly, I'm not really. I don't, I don't think we've seen too many of them. There's not been so many comps that really rely on distance to the point that we've required them. Like, not very many fly killers that re require them. Usually they just run at their own speed. So I don't think we're going to mm. see it. We might see a hyena here and there just for, like, you know, paints and webs just to be like an application boat. I don't see the other ones making a sudden appearance. Yeah, we haven't uh, actually seen people make use of those long range webs to sit back and just you know chill. It's see either been the Belgorns with their other mid range webs or um, the close range kind of tackle cruisers happening. So that's been an interesting change for me as well. Um, it could just be points or it could just be meta, but then again, those are technically the same things I've said. Um, so hopefully we'll have the teams arriving here soon. Um, but in the meantime, Jintan, do you have any predictions for what might show up in this match? Uh, whilst I don't have uh, any predictions for what might uh, for what specifically might show up, I feel like Waffles are going to have something interesting for us. They always try and bring at least some interesting spice uh, to a composition. You know, as we saw in previous alliance tournaments with them losing most, uh, with them losing a uh, Rab Yasu quite early on in one of the alliance tournaments, they aren't afraid to bring out their big guns early on and and show us something uh, interesting. Well, I wouldn't consider the second weekend, uh, second days uh, a bit uh, early, but um, definitely I hope some uh, amazing things are going to be showing up here. I'm, I, I kind of have uh, personal some high hopes here for aggressively mid-tier. Uh, Jin, uh, sorry, Wingnut, do you have any kind of predictions for what's going to be showing up here just soon? One thing I want to say is I there is no Dominix or Naga ban, so I'm wondering if someone's going to pop out that you know, really strong Dominix Naga comp we've seen and see if they're going to try and make use of it, but... Honestly, I'm, I'm going to love watching this match. Like Waffles versus Mid-Tier, who's, you know, more compelling on her name. It's going to be beautiful to watch. So, uh, Haldine, do you have any kind of favorites for this match? Uh, I think uh, Waffles have, have done a really good showing so far. Um, I really like the comps they're bringing in general. So, um, you know, they have my vote. And Jujek? I flew on their team for a year, so I kind of want to see Waffles <laughs> do well. Oh, bias. But I mean, I, I'm I'm a fan of the Rocket Pell team of aggressively mid tier, but that's generally just because um, they've been my scrim partners. So I'm a bit biased in this regard. Um, oh, so we'll, we'll see at the show. I'm, I'm wondering if the Widows are actually going to be showing up again today. Um, that would make me excited to see that. Like, but like Jinten says, I, I really would like to see some new special stuff showing up here. Um, because luckily we haven't had too much, I'd say, of a stale meta. We've uh, seen some really interesting stuff, just like the game before with Volta bringing stabbers for the Mimitar Rush. That was really nice to see from them and well executed as well. Uh, which is a perfect combination, bringing a wonderful team and executing it well. But we do have the teams taking their arena now, so we will be going over there shortly, and it'll be myself and Wingnut commentating this game. And we're here now in the arena with aggressively mid-tier in the red and Waffles in the blue. Wingnut, what are we looking at? I'm just going to be a moment to lock them up. We've got uh, aggressively mid-tier in an Ageddon, Oniris, double Ishtar, Magus, Nurgle, Heretic comp. And then Waffles bringing a double Geddon, Zarmad, Prophecy, Mauler, double Claw comp. This is, uh, uh, okay. Th that double Geddon is definitely standing out right now. So um, they definitely have uh, delivered on the interesting factor. So we have three Armageddons here on field. So it will be a bit of an interesting new battle. Um, one thing to note for these Armageddons, um, from experience that I've had, is uh, they won't be running cap charge, obviously, and they're meant to keep their newts running because they don't have the NOS bonus that a Bogorn would have. But the issue that they have is if you're constantly pulsing that uh, cap booster with the 3,200 charges, they will generally run out of cap charges relatively quickly and most of the game then they'll just end up being dead in the water so we'll see how effective the newts are throughout the game um but the prophecy is likely also going to be offering a bit more extra support as we do have the countdown happening now quick mention as well the two ishtars on the um aggressively mid-tier team have no guns fitted so i suspect they might have offloaded some of the newts from an armageddon and brought it into these two ishtars instead so i expect to see a lot of newting power maximum suck in this match it's going to be then be interesting to see what's happening with the drones. So we're going to be having the, the ships themselves not doing much on the offensive side, just more controlling. While most of the damage is going to be happening from the drones as the game is underway and you have drones launched, but there's no sentries in sight, just more going for the classic flying drones over and smashing in your face. 
full set of heavies coming out from his discharge. And we're seeing uh, Vorian getting pounded upon, and so is Cyclo. And look at poor Willy Lion Mackenzie in the claw. He almost went down, but he's obviously safe in armor. This damage is going sp spread everywhere. Both discharge being hit, both Armageddon's being hit, the claw being hit. Obviously, since they're versing Azama, they can sp split damage and force Azam to pick something to save, but instead they're now just going for the Zarm itself with. Oh, yeah, that's a big old cloud of drones. Oh yeah, hopefully um, they can get that down. Um, the Onyaris on the um, mid-tier side um, able to keep clear of any tackle or drones right now, no being, not being committed. Just the Ishtar of Psycho taking the pressure there. There is some rep drones flying around on the aggressively mid-tier side, so they're contributing to keeping that Ishtar up right now. Um, while we do have the Zarm kind of slowly dipping down there right now, hopefully these reactive is going to start helping him, but it's not looking good right now. Well, he's getting two different sets of... Uh drones on him at the moment so his reactive's trying i just love this absolute brawl in the center we've got an ishtar tackled by a maul attacked by a magus being neutered by an arm again who's also tackling the ishtar it's beautiful <laughs> it's just an it's like a tackle mess. tackle chain brawl cluster rep fight fest we'll say trying to avoid all the swear words there but we finally have the onirus hero on the aggressive mid-tier side uh, he's taking some heavy chunks out of his armor there Ooh. he's probably going to go and down this, the now, armageddon but... of jommy verpio is smart bombing of all the rep drones from aggressively mid-tier he just removed like two or three sets of rep drones off of this ishtar so now there's and we have rep drones left saving ishtar we have Keith in the army getting here, you know, getting onto his Onyros, trying to clear out his, uh, these heavy bots on oh, his no, Logi, but it's a bit down. too late. Oh, yeah, just a bit too late. And his arm's still live on the Waffle side, so um, it probably might be putting the aggressively mid tier in a bad position here right now. Especially after the Armageddon just removed the sets of rep drones that Ishtar had. So the Ishtar now essentially has only his own tank, and this is more rep drones on the way. I'm not seeing any, so. He might not be long for this world either. This team might start falling apart as that Zarmad is still holding on for dear life. I don't like Zarmads, and, but he is doing the one thing he can do well. Tank. And, and while the battle is progressing towards that side of the arena with the Zarmair, we do have the two Armageddons left on the uh, grid here of Annalise and Keith still kind of duking it out, holding each other down. And you can almost say canceling each other out. And for that reason, I'm wondering why the Magus of Ruma is sticking around there when he's not contributing too much in that uh, brawl there happening. Yeah, that two Armageddon's is just really powerful in the new power they've got, as well as the extra utility highs. If they're not going to bother with missiles, which as far as I can see, they have not bothered because they don't really get any missile buffs at all, they're just going to bring in lots of newts and lots of smart bombs. Everyone is charged, gets, you know, newted, smart bombed, and killed. I did take a look earlier, and um, all the Geddons on field have uh, newts, uh, well, sorry, no hard points visible on them. Um, we have seen some smart bombs being fired by them, but they may mostly seem uh, to be using the newts and the smart bombs. Um, the Magus of Rima has finally given up on um, trying to intervene in that Armageddon Duke out brawl happening over there, but um, we're still going to be seeing the aggressively mid-tier team slowly getting uh, whittled down here by the drone damage as they have obviously lost their Lachi and the Zarm is still live on the opposing side. Yeah, and again, all of these, like, once again, three-way brawls. Ishtar attacking like a prophecy, also being tackled by Omegas. It's just beautiful to watch. And that Zarm now, it will start just, you know, showing his strength because there's not enough DPS really to kill anything with the Zarm on field. The Zarm will rep anything back up alive as a Nurgle is being destroyed. A Magus is being hit, and Ishtar is being pounded down. It's just, yeah, there's nothing they can do now. The Zarm will actually start, you know, pulling anything back from the depth. Yeah, it is a wonderful side here looking out, watching the newts come out from Keith onto three different ships. You know, just that level of control this Armageddon can exert. Unfortunately, it's still just not enough. I think the two Armageddons from the Waffle side, along with the, the combination of having the Zarm there, most likely just giving them the edge over aggressively mid to here. I think the Zarm being a bit more of a self reliant ship versus the Oniros, having only a single rep to power instead of a whole array in the high slots. Oh, yeah. Two maximum suck Geddens versus one maximum suck Geddon. The two do seem to win. And yeah, nothing is like, if any of these ships, like one of the Geddens or one of the Ishtars, managed to get on top of the Zarm, yeah, this match could have gone entirely the other direction with enough nuke pressure, but nothing was able to get there. Everything got tackled down by everything else. It was just a massive brawl in the center, which at, by the end of it, the Zarm managed to outlast and just keep his team going. Definitely. So it's like you say, a lot of cancellation happening in the beginning and more just reliant on the drones going everywhere. But that did mean with the cancellation that was happening there, the Zarm was able obviously to pull range and um, outrange the Oneros as you have to see the two more supports being lost on aggressive materials. So that Zarm having the uh, range advantage of the Oneros just means it also had um, more advantage, uh, well, you know, more negation against the newts being uh, present on the battlefield. Uh, 
pretty sure I also saw a smart bomb at least on that Zarm. So he was also trying to smart bomb off drones off of him as well. So a lot of good utility on these smart bombs and nukes this team has brought to just remove re 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 drones, remove DPS drones, control ships. It is honestly like, I quite like this comp. It's not the highest in terms of DPS, but the level of control must be off the absolute scale. Mm, definitely so, I'd say as well. And uh, that does uh, speak well to the coordination that's happening um behind the door closed doors which you can't really see here unfortunately but you know with all the newts happening there the uh, tackle that they need to put everywhere that means there's a high level communication that has to happen on the fly as soon as they land out on the grid to coordinate where they needed everything at once so definitely a good job to waffles here as they looking to grind down keith here uh, for the last armageddon just to clean up the field yeah, leaving the most tanky boat till last because he can't do anything at this point anyway. He's, he's got no DPS drones as far as I can see. He's got nothing but nukes and smart bombs. Just let him leave him there to suffer. And look, look how so. much tank he has. This is why they didn't bother. Look how much tank he has. It took him so long to get DPS onto him. Now they've got two Gens worth of drones. They've got proxy drones, Mauler's gun. And look how slow this guy goes down. Imagine doing that under nuke pressure and get damage from other ships. Just don't bother. Yeah, no. And unfortunately for Keith, he's pretty much been trapped in that one location, I think, for most of this match. Um, you know, Waffles pretty much uh, it seems to make the call like, hey, you know, we've got two Geddens, you've got one. We don't care if we, you know, cancel out one of our Geddens if that means you lose one. That means we're still going to have one Geddon free to run around the map and just neutralize the rest of your stuff. So Waffles making the good call there of just canceling out the new pressure that the uh, Aggressively mid tier was going to threaten them with there as they have Keith here disappearing now and we'll be heading back to the studio. Take your order. Uh, oh, I'll have a. Uh, no. Oh, maybe. No. Hmm. I'll have. No. Oh, maybe. Are you planning on a day, sir? I'll have a. Bar guest. How original. And with extra paladin. Daring today, aren't we? We've all had trouble. Multi-spectrums not as hard as they used to be. The little blue pill, so you can last all fight long. Slaves, get your ass back here! And welcome back. We just saw Waffles take a convincing win over aggressive mid-tier here with an interesting control matchup happening there on the newt side of things. Jintan, any comments? Yeah, that was a really interesting... It was one of those matches where you get to just watch two teams really trade resources. And, you know, <laughs> as we saw eventually, uh, they uh, Vydra came out... Sorry, not Vydra my gosh waffles 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 came out on top sorry uh I, i'm watching still getting used to watching these games without fancy ui uh but yeah they were able to just absolutely take control of the match and clear things up to the point where there was only one ship left down the end of it and it was just about you know doing damage control whilst you uh, pick it apart so howling if you're watching that match uh, what do you think about all the geddens in that match showing up now yeah, I thought that was a really interesting matchup. It's it's, it's always cool when two similar comps uh, collide like that. You get to get to really like get down to the the individual pilot skill and stuff like that. But um, man, those double double gens doing work, uh, capping stuff out and chasing things down. I saw the the one gen getting on top of that Aneros, uh must have been like you know midway through the match or something like that. Just uh, spells doing pretty much. As soon as you get a newton ship right in your logi, that's that's a real bad time to be a, a logi pilot. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it can definitely be frustrating. And uh, Jujak, uh, what do you think gave Waffles the edge in this match to actually push them over the uh, domination here on aggressive mid-tier? 
Well, first, if nobody else is going to say it, I'm going to say that match sucked. But uh, <laughs> I honestly think that when you go come to a control versus control, if you slow the game down enough, the heavier control often gets an edge. Like, it, it helps being extreme, and they went on the extreme uh, survivability and the extreme nuding pressure path to victory in it worked out for them very well i think this goes back to what you were saying wing that it's you know that uh what you've been trying to bash into these teams of if you're going newts you go for newts absolutely if you're gonna bring newts you've got to go the whole way and especially if the other team brings newts as well then it's gonna bring even more newts and if they bring more newts, you're gonna bring even more newts and it just becomes <laughs> a cold war of how much capacity can we suck away from the other team so, Jintan, um, do you think the choice of Logi also played into effect here with the Oniros versus the Zarm? Yeah, obviously the Oniros gets to um, be more effective when it's conserving its cap. Uh, even if that didn't really seem to help a huge amount in over the course of the fight, you know, in theory it does give it a, a, a massive amount of advantage because even though the Zarm is more cap efficient with its repairs, it needs to keep them active for a long period of time and turning it off really hurts it whereas uh, the Aneros can burst on and off at will. Mm. I almost... Um, it's hard, hard for me to say, but I almost want to say it's like the, the opposite uh, opinion that I have is that the Aneros would be suffering more because it has to keep four reps that it has to try and cycle constantly, um, whereas uh, Zarm only has one. Obviously, then there's the spool that comes into it. So, you know... You know what you win on, uh, lose on the swings. You win on the roundabouts. I kind of say, I suppose. Um, but then again, it's two Gettons versus one, which I think was the main thing here. Uh, Harling, do you have any comments on the logistics? I kind of uh, um, agree with you. I mean, uh, obviously, I, I'm a big fan of the Zarm. The the extra range, I think, did it did it as well because uh, once they locked down the uh, Armageddon on the on the enemy team, it, they could keep the Zarm far away from it, which kind of reduced the amount of Newt pressure that it had to deal with. Um, that being said, the the, the Aneros can do the whole like overload the rack, cap booster, get like a huge burst of reps off. Um, for you know, usually for only one rep per cycle, but still, it's a it's a decent amount of burst rep. So um, yeah, I mean, in that case, it, uh, having like the four large reps can be uh, super handy. But I think the Zarm in this case uh, it worked out as a better choice. And Dujak, um, why would people, well, why would Waffles have brought a prophecy and maybe not like a Myrmidon? Well, the the first reason, obviously, to me, seems to be the fact that it is a lot more durable. Like you, you might run into matchups where a, a Myrm can be killed, but a prophecy is almost never worth going for. I think the main or... difference, of course, is that the prophecy is resist, whereas the Merm is self rep. So in this situation with Logi, the prophecy is far superior. Yeah, definitely. Also, I had a lot of wormholers on my team, but it's been a while since I lived in wormholes. Like, do people put Nosses on their Sarmaz? Like, is that a thing that happens these days? Because they do have a lot of utility eyes. Can they try to Nos off their own team? Or um you can they obviously don't get any range bonus or any kind of bonus um not seeing off your own team you can consider it a valid tactic but that would mean someone has to be you know within like 10 ish kilometers for your whole time and um i don't think it's that viable as well to be honest um no so it's also on like when you're mentioning worm homeless tq that's not a thing either um so maybe some janky stuff that's happening on that side of the world with you there. Um, but the next game and the final game for this evening that we'll be having is Sudden Vydra. Uh, I think it should be... Okay, versus Wolves Amongst Strangers. Jintan, can you go over the bands that they've chosen for this game? Absolutely. We had the, 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 the Maddens for our final match of the day. This is going to be very exciting. We have Sudden Vydra banning out the Scimitar Zarmaz. Uh, and Balgorn, whereas Wolves Amongst Strangers have banned out the Curse, Eos, and Hyperion. So some real power bands there from Wolves, and again, almost just pure power bands from Vydra. Definitely so. And um, 
Uh, Wayne, I think we were speaking about it before with the Geddon versus the Balgorn, but now we're seeing the Balgorn here being banned and not the Geddon. So what's your uh, whole opinion on Balgorn versus Geddon? Still waiting for people to catch up. <laughs> I, I don't see Balgorn being particularly good in the 77s. Uh, the one thing I, I find interesting though is Vajra banned out Scimitar and Zarmab, but they left the Atana open as well as the Oniros. So that does leave like, you can't decide, like, what are they banning these for? Are they going for that? Are they going for this? Like, they, leave, they left both routes open to keep the comp opponents guessing, but still ban out some pretty strong ships. I'd not, actually, I still don't agree with the Balgorn, though. Armageddon ban. I I'm think that's, that could be a deliberate strategy, because there's something you can do is you can ban out, you know, one or two ships that are good but not crucial parts of compositions and try and trick your opponents into bringing suboptimal sub variations of something that you think you have a strong chance of beating if you have a good comp up your sleeve. I'm wondering, and this is a kind of speculation on my part, but if we're going to be seeing um, an ECM comp again, because banning a scimitar means you're leaving the Basilisk and the EOS, oh, the, sorry, the Basilisk and the Tana open. Um, and when you're running ECM, you kind of want to um, prepare to contend with Kaldari anyway on the opposing side. So, you know, if you're banning a scimitar, that means you don't maybe have to stress too much about Minmatar jams. Although, you know, there's still like a AC rush that could happen. Um, Howling, do you have any thoughts on these bans? Yeah, that's such a good point. Um, you just made about now they could potentially stack Kaldari jams and and, and work uh, on the basis that they're going to try and bring like a Bassi or an Atana, um, which would be super strong if they could do that um try and get them into into running a comp like that and you jack do you have any thoughts the only other thing i could think of is that they want to fly something fast where they could catch perhaps a natana or a basilisk but have more of a problem catching the scimitar hmm, that's definitely uh fair to say um I still uh, think the Belgorn might be a tiny bit of a wasted ban, but um, obviously Sun Vidra is in the tournament and I am not, so they have a bit more experience, you know, with what's meta. Um, so hopefully we'll see something interesting there. I'm, I'm kind of thinking that we might see it the East, go the ECM route. Um, Jintan, do you have any thoughts on what we might see here? Um, no, I don't really. It's hard to say. You know, what you guys were talking about, about the potential of maybe baiting, uh, of maybe uh, trying to bait an ECM, uh, like, a, sorry, about the um, Atana and the Basilisk to bait an ECM shift could happen, but I don't know. I'm just excited to see this. This is a really tense match here. Vydra do want to pull out a victory here if it's all possible. And we do actually have the teams uh, arriving here on the grid now. So we will be going over shortly, and it will be uh, Jintan and myself that will be commentating on the last game for this evening. And welcome to the arena here. We're having the last game for the evening, game 52 of Southern Vydra versus Wolves Amongst Us. Uh, Jin Tan, can you go over what we've seen on grid right now? Absolutely here. Southern Vydra have brought along a very interesting shield setup with an Atana, a Varga, a double healer, Bifrost, and double Zvipo. Uh What have Wolves Amongst Strangers brought to compete against it? Oh, sorry, no, that's, so, the, that's the Wolves setup that I just read out. My apologies. Oh, it's all good. It can be confusing when the teams are rapidly moving into the arena. So we're on the um, Vydra side, then. We're going to be having um, Double Dominix, Double Merm, Double Vexor, uh, Double Vigil. Um, Varga is an interesting choice for me. I think it's going to be one of the first Marauders we've seen in the game. Um, we are having some technical difficulty right now. I think we have three destroyers on grid right now from the Wolves Amongst Us side with the double spitball and a Bifrost. So uh, the refs are going to be saying what we do while the countdown is still happening. Hopefully they can pause it, um, but we'll see what happens here. Uh -oh. um, this, this happens every now and again. We're, uh, we'll have to make game sure. game is underfoot. So uh, we'll, we'll kill the game as it happens, um, and we'll see what the refs say later. But the teams are on the way. Yep, there we go. You see massive damage already going out on Blue Morpheus and the Antana. All those drones there just hitting him with almost perfect tracking. And you can see there in a, a bay, <laughs> nearly hitting armor almost immediately, even as these active reps come in. Uh, the Myrmidon of Head Candir is taking DPS right now as well. 
but it is not it's not even enough to compete with how much damage this uh Itana is taking. Uh, that's definitely one of the um, flaws, or not the weak points of the, the Tana is it might have the reps, it might have the mid slots, but it does not have the buffer. So if you just hit it and, and keep hitting it, you're going to have that bleed, and eventually it dies just as we see now. As the Myrmidon on the Vyger side is still taking a beating, but it's still comfortably in armor there right now. Yeah, and that is a huge, a huge, huge part of uh, the sudden, sorry, the Wolf Among Strangers team there taking off the grid. That Tana was going to provide them their long they have long game assurance if they could keep it alive it would mean that when it came down to a 4v4 they would have an absolutely massive advantage now that that's not the case they need to burn through these ships just as quickly as they're getting burnt through on the other side or they are guaranteed a loss it's actually interesting that we previously talked at the desk about um, prophecies versus myrmidons i was actually a myrmidon being following here by the Vyger side, and that self-repair bonus on the Myrmidon is actually coming into effect here as it was able to, um, you know, mitigate a lot of the damage coming in as it is dipping in destruction now, but he's definitely bought his team a lot of time as he goes down there, but the uh, Varger on the Lupus side, uh, Wolf side, you know, dipping into low armor now. Yeah, and whilst that Varga might have the high slots to put out a couple of smart bombs, it doesn't look like it's going to be enough to kill off these bonus drones before these bonus drones kill it. You know, I can only see one smart bomb, uh, one color of smart bomb firing off here, so it's going to be very, very slow going. And he is already in the hull. Oh, interesting that I want to mention here is the Gilas are actually using hams. Um, normally you see them use rapid lights, but they've opted to go for the heavy assault missiles in this case as the Vigil on Vyger's side um, taking some damage. So they've elected to get rid of that uh, those bonus paints, which have helped them apply um, damage, although it was a battleship that issued before as the Varga goes down. Yeah, there we go. Now we're back to a five on five, but we've got a very, very big points advantage on the field for Vydra here. Uh, Nick and Noisy are now the primary for the Wolves Among Strangers side as the uh, the healers and the healer drones and these vehicles start to take make work on it. But then we see Soldier in armor already. This is the last remaining chunk, a big part of DPS there from the Wolves Among Us strain. Ah, the Wolves Among Strangers side going down. Oh, and the Gila definitely disappearing there. So the Gilas do have a shield resistance bonus, which definitely makes them tanky. But if you don't have reps, the resistances don't help you that much because, you know, resistances more help, uh, you know, getting the hit points back, going down, hit points back, going down. So those reps definitely make the Gila resistances uh, all the more worthwhile. But without them, they're definitely suffering right now. Yeah, these Dominixes are doing so well. The tracking bonuses that they get are just helping them to pepper damage right onto these healers even without the uh even without them being webbed down by their tackle because obviously these two vexes just aren't quite fast enough to keep up with these healers and there we go another one down and the Myrmidon of uh, Nikonoisia disappears at the same time with the Swipples and Destroyer Club ganging up on him. Um, so while they might be illegal, they're still quite deadly. <laughs> um, so it's just Destroyers now to wrap up on from one of the game. Yeah, they left They left the Cheetahs for last, you know, as an example. And I've got to applaud them for that. Vajra here proving that even though the rules were broken, their spirits were not. And they came here ready to win. So... Um... Yeah, I think what generally happens is people, uh, because we have the thing with, you know, Logi doesn't count against their home limit for their, against cruisers, people can sometimes get confused and like, they get so into the mindset of, oh, just put links in the comp and then make the comp. With, so they kind of almost have this mindset of, oh, links don't count against the limit as well. But in this case, a command destroyer does still count as a destroyer. Yeah, and at the end of the day, in this case, it just doesn't matter because Vydra took home the W without without the competition mattering regardless. They basically got an extra chance to run this match home. And we can see the Bifrost just running around the arena now, trying to chase Jones. Look he's, like he's probably going to go for an MJD there to Boundary. I'm not too sure if he can make the angle on that MJD unit, but at the very least, he does seem to be making a beeline for the Boundary. Yeah, well, he's got five minutes to decide how he wants to die, so he better pick a good way. Looks like he's just going to go for the classic MWD out, missing MG unit. And there we go. Uh, Vyger taking a win over Wills Amongst Us. Unfortunately, Wills Amongst Us did as well violate the rules, um, but I don't think that matters in this regard. And we'll be heading back to the studio for final comments.
That's what I'm talking about, guys. We've made a great effort so far. Let's just keep it up. That's right! We can't have anyone freak out out there, okay? We've got to keep our composure! We've come too far! There's too much to lose! We've got to just keep our composure! <laughs> And welcome back. Uh, we just saw Southern Viger take the wing over Wolves Amongst Us. Um, so while it was discussed in the tournament as we we're commentating, uh, there was a rules violation on Wolves Amongst Us part. Um, unfortunately, they brought three destroyers. So regardless of the outcome of the match, Wolves would have forfeited the match. Um, so Viger would have taken the win anyway. Uh, wing 10, uh, wing, wing 10, my bad. Uh, wing nut, <laughs> any thoughts? Honestly, that match was just clean and quick. They managed to grab that Atana really quickly and just remove it. At that point, your Gealers, which have great resist, mean nothing. That's definitely so. I fully agree on that. Um, definitely able to volley them down there. Uh, Haldane, any thoughts on your side? Yeah, it's uh, pretty convincing. I mean, those, those take two drones just putting in work as per usual. Uh... It, it, especially like these max DPS teams, I, I'm not a big fan of them, but clearly they're doing absolute work and uh, can just wipe the field. Mm. And uh, Jujak, I'm sure you have some things to say on this match. I found that uh, their bands were perfect into this. You definitely, like, it's obvious why they ban a scimitar for its speed, whereas if they're going to take long-range webs and heavy drones dealing EM damage, any team their opponent has that relies on a shield tanked and somewhat slow large sheet can get caught and killed before it can do anything about it mm -hmm. so jintan with you waving over there for attention uh what do you have to say just trying to fix my terrible terrible camera which seems to be glitching out all the time or uh, as the chat seems to put it it's sending me to another direction but i actually wanted to ask uh for something else i wanted to get the ratings on that boundary violation guys what are we giving that out of 10 i'm giving that a three personally that was that's a pretty pathetic one two piss poor effort uh to be honest I i'm gonna give it a five just because I, I think it was more out of respect for their opponents after having the rules violation just to try and end the match um all right so points. that was actually the last game for evening so just quickly uh running through all of you if you have any favorite games for what we've seen today um you're allowed to pick the same thing uh so halving do you have any favorite games of today's uh, list oh i think uh without being a fanboy too much i think it was the volta match for me i love a bit of the old uh ac slap rush and it was just satisfying to see stuff get shredded basically uh okay and do jack I was going to pick that, but to be honest, I, I do love, I did love the the Raven, uh, <laughs> the Raven comp a lot. So if I can't pick Minmatar Rush, destroying Minmatar Rush with Ravens would be my second pick. So going against AFK Slepners is what your your dream comp uh, match is. <laughs> <laughs> and Gentan. Ooh, it's a really difficult one. Uh... I'm going to have to look at the schedule again, if I'm honest, but I really did enjoy just managing to see, see Flaming Dwagons, just because their name is so fun to say, if I'm going to be perfectly honest. I'm sure we've all had uh, fun trying to say that name in the heat of the moment. And uh, Wingnut, anything from your side? Definitely the Armageddon and this time match, just because it vindicated everything I've been saying for the past like two or three weeks. If you're going to bring notes, you bring all the notes. Mm -mm, that's definitely so um i kind of also liked armageddon's but on a different side i just like seeing three armageddon's in the single match a uh, bunch of control happening there um but then also just want to speak uh, shout out to the teams that have unfortunately been eliminated now um so we unfortunately won't be seeing forklift certified golfs odin's voicemails spectre fleet ramrod shenanigans jovco mining division 
Flaming Dragons <laughs> and aggressively mid-tier again. So um, with that, we'll also next uh, scheduled round events will be happening on the coming Saturday. Um, we'll be taking it from there. And then just huge shout out to everyone that's actually submitted ads thus far. Thank you very much for making an entertaining stream and helping us with this production. Um, we really appreciate all the ads that have submitted. You're still welcome to try and submit some more ads. Um, we'll see if we have time to put them in, but you know, it's before Thursday would be fantastic if you could submit those. Um, hopefully you can find the information that in our Discord. And um, with that, also just want to thank CCP for them just helping us uh, have access to Thunderdome, have everything running in the background, CCP Aurora, CCP Swift, and also the awesomely famous CCP chair who has been with us throughout this entire evening like a soldier she is. Um, and with that, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this evening. Uh, hopefully you'll stick around for the raid we have, and we hope to see you next weekend. Have a great evening. Peace. 15 seconds to make a cool AT at. It's got to have dank content. Overused MLG man. <laughs> and MLG Daniel wait. No profanity. How am I supposed to make an AT ad without saying fuck? What is the best Indian wormhole corp? That's Biotech LD. Ah, you're teasing me, naughty naughty. Bold is actually not an Indian corporation. Bold is actually not a wormhole corporation. Bold is recruiting. No ego PVP. Introducing Grath Telkin, your personal assistant from Pandemic Legion. Hey Grath, I'm 15 jumps out. Can I still get in on the fleet? How the f*** are you 15 jumps away? Why would you be 15 jumps away from where the f*** we are? 